So we're heading live right now. We should be live on GT midterms group nine. I'm just gonna make sure everything is looking good. Great, okay, welcome. Uh, this is the graduate thesis midterm. I'm Devin Weiser. I'll be our group leader for today's review. Uh, we're going to see thesis proposals from students advised by Margaret Griffin, Peter Testa, and myself. And um, we'd like to first just welcome our guests. Um, we have uh, Kristen Smith joining us, <laughs> who's hanging with us today, who has a practice in San Francisco and she teaches at the California College of the Arts. And um, we're especially excited because it's our understanding that you work with community organizations to reimagine public space. And I think this is a, a theme that several of our students are engaged in. We also have Russell Thompson, who has an LA-based practice RN Thompson and he's designed faculty at SciArc. Um, several of you have had Russell from uh, the MA1 program. And we also are joined by Ming Fung, partner at Hodgets and Fung and design faculty at SciArc. So to uh, just give you a little bit of information about how we're going to run the event. Um, today we have seven presentations. Some students are working on their own and a couple of teams. Uh, each student or team will present for five minutes or so, and then we'll leave about 15, 20 minutes for conversation. The students have one month to develop the project and, and they will be back on Zoom for a presentation in early September. I'd like to just thank everyone for their time and joining us today. The students are, I think, doing an incredible job um, with or without the kind of remote circumstances. The work is really interesting. So we're very excited for their presentation and conversations today. And we're going to start off with Erwin. So Erwin, please uh, feel free to share the screen. Thank you everyone for joining us. Hi guys. Um, my name is Erwin. I will be presenting my thesis now. Um, here we go. Um, so the title of my thesis is Stacks on Stacks on Stacks. Um, it started out primarily, primarily as a uh, stacking, um, as a response to hoarding and as a way to conserve um, space. Um, so some of the things I've been looking at, I've, I've been looking at Barry Dixtra's work. He's an interior designer from Netherlands. He's also a hoarder and he collects all sorts of objects. He stacks them together into interesting, almost random compositions. Um, I was also looking at Louis Nevelson um, and the way she stacks uh, different objects and paints them uh, in one color as a way uh, to unify, as a unifying structure. Um, and ultimately, uh, I was looking at- the, the image is not changing. Oh, there it is. Sorry. Sorry. It's Sorry. Hear me. What? Keep going. It's my bad. Oh. I okay. it wasn't changing. Oh, <laughs> okay. So um, I was also looking at Teho Remy's um, work um, titled, you can't lay down your memories, which is basically um, a bunch of drawers uh, tied together by a band. And so co-opting that idea, I was trying to explore um, the meaning of, of, of the boxes and the drawers, also uh, the contents and also the scale. Um, so moving on to the miniature model that I made. Um, I made a model using soap that I molded into a shape of a drawer. Um, yeah, tied it down together. Um, so here is um, my site. It is the uh, A plus D or the former A plus D Architecture and Design Museum, um, which is now closed due to the pandemic. 
Um, so the A plus D architecture and design museum is basically reimagined as a typology of stack boxes that aims to encapsulate uh, its semi-nomadic uh, history and the idea of museum as a collection of curiosities. The museum in the form of stack drawers is tied together, um, as I mentioned, based on Tanya Raymond's, you can't lay down your memories. Um, the building itself is formally a collection of drawers uh, held tightly by a band as though it is ready for another impromptu relocation. Um, the drawers speak to the idea of a museum as an instrument for storage, preservation, and also compartmentalization of architectural artifacts in a space where they will also be exhibited. The stacking and the nomadic character is also set up as counterpoint to the museum's tendency to become hoarding institutions. Um, the typology is composed of compartments that enables places for each of the incredibly diverse voices that comprises architecture today. Um, moreover, it is uh, this cabinet and the straw stack also borrows from the idea of soap, soap boxes, uh, where applied soap textures alludes to the notion that architecture can sometimes stand on a semi raised platform where the ideas are may not always be well grounded, but should nevertheless be accessible um, to a public dialogue. Um, so here's another um, top view. And this is a section. And that's my thesis. Erwin, can you talk a little bit about how the metaphors that you're using, you talked about how the drawers are a metaphor of containment and then the soapbox is kind of a metaphor for kind of, maybe I'm misunderstanding this, but it's almost like a democratization of whatever is being on display. Can you talk a little bit about how those metaphors um, fit within the architecture that you're creating or do or, or do not? Fit within that? Um, it, I think it fits in a way that um, the museum being the storage space, normally museums would have um, art collections that um, are there to be stored but aren't really going to be shown. Um, several museums during the pandemic actually had to discard a lot of their collection um, because they're running out of space. Um, and so in in showing basically all the storage spaces, uh, no art is inaccessible or no work is inaccessible. Everything is being shown all at the same time. Um, so I think that's that's one of the ways I think it connects. So is the idea that these boxes are just open spaces and the way that they're stacked is creating the kind of variation in those space, but otherwise there is no differentiation. There is no like internal storage. Everything is open. Is that what I'm hearing? Um, oh, well, open in the sense that, um, well, there are areas where say like administrative spaces, which would, I mean, have to be closed um, to like the staff, but um, the idea is that all of the spaces would be um, accessible with regards to um, the collection. Um, Erwin, maybe I could ask a, a similar line of questioning is that, you know, if you think about the recent history of stacking and piling as a reaction to extruding and uh, perhaps ordering things in more predictable ways. They were challenges about, you know, ideas of part to whole and how things accumulate and whether or not it produces a kind of different tectonic. That's one way to look at this. And there's a territory of that that's been established. It seemed like uh, you were talking about it in terms of this kind of the, the strength of it being a space for uh, the museum 
is that it has some sort of analog with accumulation. You call it hoarding. Um, yeah. but, but that somehow that the strength of the building comes from its iconography of saying, oh, I know that associative value of, I, I have a stack like that in my apartment. Um, this must be a place of hoarding. I mean, I'm oversimplifying it on purpose. Like, is the value of it architecturally that it has a kind of iconography or does it maybe, to go back to Kristen's question, you know, have some other implication in the way the museum works or displays its material? The scenario you just described about storage is common to a lot of museums probably already. Um, I'm wondering kind of where, where you're going with it because I think one of the things we wanna to do today is to um, understand the thesis and then to maybe make constructive suggestions about how you might go on to uh, flesh it out and present it. So I, it's important for us maybe to kind of just understand where you want it, to, how you want it to be perceived. Hmm. Um. It's well, so the museum, it's an architecture museum. Um, and I think uh, it's also a way, um, there's not a lot of architecture museum and I think the existence of A plus D museum is kind of uh, like a democratizing, um, uh, what's the word? Um, almost like a monument because uh, architecture in general isn't accessible uh to most people or to like common people it's i mean the 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 stakeholders that are usually that usually have a voice uh in architecture um or who can afford to hire an architect um are the select uh few of like the upper echelon and um so i think this uh an architecture museum kind of opens up a way for um, people to kind of to to, ex to have uh, some sort of access to uh, what is otherwise only available to um, people who have their privilege. So um, I, I guess what you, um, I, I think Thank you, Russell, for asking the question. And I'm sorry, I missed part of your presentation because my internet went out. But uh, the, 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 it is an interesting notion in terms of thinking of stacking uh, because everything is equal. Maybe one, uh, one box is smaller or larger than the other one, but it's, there's really not a real hierarchy to to that. And I think it uh, it uh, it does reinforce what uh, uh, the premises that you just described. Mm -hmm. uh, but what what I'm kind of um, am interested in is like because what you're saying is that everything is equal. I'm looking at this and you can just choose whichever one, it may be different shape, but there is, uh, it's, uh, it's all, uh, uh, first of all, express uh, uh, externally, because you, you could look at this and you could imagine that the museum has uh, a certain amount of uh, uh, content information architectural uh, exhibit that is being displayed there. And at the same time, it doesn't matter whether uh, 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 the galleries as opposed to the storage and as opposed to administration, they're all very equal because they're just uh, uh, stacked one on top of the other. And, and I think from, from that point of view, you are not only uh, democratizing the, um, the, uh, uh, the collection of the museum, but you are also putting all of the program at an equal footing. Would, would that be a fair way of, of describing how you want to do your project? Um, yeah, that's, well, kind of how 
I'm trying to go towards that direction. Um, uh, the challenge actually is that even though they might all look the same when boxes are tilted uh, in some ways and are also like intersecting, it actually changes the whole uh, programmatic um, arena within mm -hmm. those because you can't put uh, floor plates that are um, you know slanted or you could fall over. Um, so that's like one of the ways that I guess the program differentiates from each one. But that's sort of the idea, at least formally. That's kind of what I'm trying to go to. I think that's one of the really beautiful things about the project. I love the image that you have on the screen right now. And I think this idea that you've got this kind of bundle, that it's got a wrapper, I mean, that would be incredible to think about tectonically how to realize that because it suggests then that the type of stacks that we know that are more about gravity where the weight's gonna go down, down, down to the bottom, you're suddenly trying to understand how to disperse, disperse the weight either sideways or maybe pieces are hanging from the top. Now, it's not an easy thing to resolve, but conceptually, I really enjoy and appreciate that you're starting to say, what are other ways we can think about stack or pile projects? So I think the tectonic side would be one, one aspect that would be worth developing. And maybe along with that, you could think about how the cores and circulation could, could help you because I don't think it's gonna magically get held up by the, by the band. But, but I think just thinking conceptually about how the boxes could jostle a little bit together. I think that's that's cool. And then the other thing I wanted to say, um, and that maybe you've already thought about this, but perhaps there's more territory to explore, which is the nature of a museum is already um, in flux right now. I mean, it was already in flux before the pandemic in terms of the idea that user experience and how curation worked has over the past five years been radically transformed uh, with everyone bringing a camera in and so forth. Um, and the kinds of relationships between in-person and online exhibition has changed. But I also think that the role of the museum has even in the past couple of months been called into question and what kinds of things, I'll put it in words that are more akin with your thesis, what kind of things get hoarded in the museum is now really an important question. So I, I think it would be worth considering and maybe just speculating on the contents in these drawers or cabinets. Like what, what does it mean to put small models of architectural projects or, you know, it could be videos or other, other types of media. But I think it goes directly to your point about how people can experience architecture in a surrogate fashion through the museum rather than in real life, so to speak. And I'm, I'm not making an argument for one or the other. I'm just saying, I think your thesis opens up the opportunity to really reconsider this format of seeing the work this way. So I, I think there's a, a lot of really cool territories that um, I'm, I'm very excited about the, the setup. I think it's, I think mm. it's very, uh, very contemporary um, and, and really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I mean, bo both Devin and, 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 and Peter, you, you are so very familiar with CCA, right? And CCA, to a certain extent, even before the pandemic, is one of the very, it's not a museum, it's a foundation, it's a center for architecture, but to a certain extent, it is a museum because it's a, it is a depository of a lot of architectural archive and a lot of the con content and information are always online. So, so you can always always get access to that. And I think that is a really good example to be thinking about it uh, from, from that point of view, because the, 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 uh, the depository of architectural content is sometimes much more than just architectural model. I mean, CCA is actually not interested in architectural model because they don't have room for that. Your museum, Irwin, is big enough to, to take on everything, you know, like an architect's archive, which has to do with 
anything from correspondence to sketches to modern, all of that. And 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 I and I think to a certain extent that 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 um, how just how do you uh, um, deliver uh, th th that content between <coughs> sorry between digital and um, you know, between digital and 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 the physical, I think is is uh, would be really kind of interesting to 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 work out, or to at least at least you know talk about. And you know, I mean, if you go to the website of the CC, I mean, they, I mean, we all receive a weekly uh, 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 mail once you subscribe to the CCA about what you should be, you know, what is the latest, what, you know, information about it. And, and it gives you a certain kind of, a, it changes completely the relationship, you know, the physical relationship and then the kind of receiving of an information on a much more uh, 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 periodical weekly basis is very, very different than going to a museum, which is much which is which is like you 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 have to make a point to go see an exhibit on that day of that week of that month and i i like you know the the, the two extreme uh yeah those are great points uh may all of these are really i i agree with everything that's being said and erwin just one thing that i would suggest is that you mentioned that floor plates have to can't be have to be horizontal, and that's not the case in museums. You know, there's the a very famous case of the Guggenheim, right? That right. barely has any flat uh, floor uh, space. So, in an architecture museum, uh, most certainly could take advantage of non, you know, of inclined planes because you can imagine that you get an overview over a field of models, all kinds of things are possible. Um, mm -hmm. There was that really nice installation that was made at SciR in the gallery, I guess. I don't know, when was that? Do you guys remember, Margaret? The one that with the inclined plane of the, um, uh, yeah, Jesse, what was that? The, the one with the, the ecology, right? So was Herwig and Marcelin, I think. From Herwig and Marcelin, yeah. So, you know, so anyway, that's just, it's not the most important point, but it is something to consider. Yeah. I think my, um, my biggest critique of your project is actually, I think there's lots of really exciting stuff happening here. I specifically love the slide with the drawers, with the little, um, I mean, just seeing the drawers all wrapped in the ribbon and the little section of it on the side. Um, I actually think it would be really helpful to be more specific with yourself. I mean, it might not have just come through in this presentation, but just be really specific with yourself about what you're interested in so that you can push it into that territory. Because I feel like there's a lot of potential right now that it could go into... Um, a lot of different directions and I'm hesitating to kind of push you in one of those directions because that would be kind of my intention pushed on you and what I'm really interested in and I think you should be interested in the thesis project is really how are you hoping to kind of push the dialogue um, into you know whether it's a formal trajectory where it's really just exploring what is the potential of all these stacking box boxes and maybe the program kind of know, falls away a little bit so you can really push that agenda. Um, or maybe it's really combining the kind of program of the architecture and design museum with this idea of stacking and hoarding. And what is the potential in that? Because that is a whole other thing that I think is not quite showing up in your, in your architectural drawings yet, but that could, you know, this is a huge museum. It's ac actually, it has, you know, it's creating architecture, but if you're also talking about the intention of like hoarding and kind of showing everything, it could also collect architecture, it could be built out of artifacts of architecture, you know, in this kind of hoarding mm -hmm. fashion that is not just like a metaphor of a drawer, but actually literally takes buildings and kind of stacks them on top of one another in a, in a way that 
gives a different perception. So I would just be really clear about what you're most passionate about in terms of where you are right now and really kind of honing in on that for the next month so that you can really push it um, in a direction that feels satisfying to you. And maybe if I could... Oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Russell. I was just going to say I thought those were great, great comments. And um, I'm sorry, that, um, Russell. If you just have a, a quick comment, we'll we'll try to stay on yeah, okay, on message here. Yeah, no. I mean, I'll, I'll make it quick. I I think that uh, I, I would echo those comments that were just made, but maybe to qualify it by saying I I don't think I would try to develop it as a, a project. Uh, you know, where you're sort of figure everything out too much. Uh, I think it's it also the the resolution of the exterior right now. I mean, you could keep making versions of it, but I have a sense that um, it's saying what you want it to say, and that maybe the work resides on its uh, the way that it makes you rethink the collection, how it's organized. Mm -hmm. uh, you push hoarding into the idea that uh, it's a building where you're never sure if you saw the whole thing or not. Um, when you go through it because it doesn't have that kind of hierarchy that maybe a Guggenheim would have or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I would push some of those things so about how the figures of the rooms are within those pieces, whether or not there's overlap in them, uh, whether or not it produces anomalies. It, it's a funny institution because it prides itself on always trying to be contrarian and contradictory. You know, the idea of the impermanent collection comes to mind. Um, so I, I would just maybe tie it more to what that building is and that institution is and let the architecture kind of rethink its contents. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Margaret. If you have any other comments for Irwin, otherwise we'll move forward. Great. Thank you, Irwin. We appreciate you sharing the work today. And now we're going to switch over to Shin, Lu, and Yu Ting Zhu. And this is actually a shared team between Peter and myself. So um, take it away, Shin and Yu Ting. Um, we can also share our mirror board to the notes so you can get into our mirror board. Yeah, uh, we'll put it in the chat. Uh, all right. Uh, good afternoon. My name is uh, Xin Liu from MRC2. Uh, I'm Yu Ting from MRC1. Um, our thesis topic is the digital supermarket. Digital here means a really intense combination of physical and digital. That's where the term comes from. In architecture, we try to explain certain types of imaging, uh, of certain types of imaging and representation, and how they could influence the world we know. Our digital investigation is playful. Uh, it's playful reappropriation of existing forms and playing no products in fresh ways to explore unimaginable potentials. We've taken specific formal objects and we here go with specific techniques that create digital possibilities. By exploring the deep logic behind the techniques and applying to the physical forms, we alter physical form to something which is not physical, not digital, not physical plus digital, but both at the same time as saying digital. Um, here we can see some digital, inter digital spatial interfaces. Um, and this is the development of the function of digital. It shows, it shows the huge potential in architecture. Interface is fundamentally the place at which independent and often unrelated systems meet and act on or communicate with each other. For mobile phones, a user, uh, a user interface is a graphic and usually touch sens sensitive display that allows the user to interact with the apps, features, content, and functions. Here, we bring the notion of interface into architecture as spatial interface which means we can interact with the form of the space to meet the changing needs of experience, functions, or narratives. 
So here, uh, let's take a look at the four digital spatial interfaces we developed uh, based on the strategy which combines physical objects and the digital techniques. As you can see now, we are looking at the first one, which is called the 3D elevator. Uh, this spatial interface combines a plastic bottle with uh, digital techniques called the uh, Warner Fractory. Uh, and uh, finally, it creates a 3D elevator which can carry objects from one point to another point in 3D uh, in a non-linear way. So here is a close-up view. So uh, this one is called the motion graphics package. Uh, as we know, in traditional supermarket, uh, they, use the, they use the package design uh, to show the flat uh, graphic design, and they use the uh, flat uh, screen to show uh, advertisement. Uh, we combine both and at the same time, so all the packages become uh, uh, dynamic animated motion graphics advertisement. As you can see here, uh, this is uh, <clears throat> uh, the package of a uh, bottle and uh, it shows cold pressed uh, strawberry. And there are customized emoji on it. Everything is animated in 2D, but they are wrapped uh, to 3D objects. So uh, this one called it Mike Faye. Uh, it's basically a personalized uh, uh, dining area where people can choose uh, the place uh, where they want to uh, eat. And uh, at, in different points, the table has different shapes and uh, uh, it's uh, responsibly uh, responding to the, uh, the number of people. And here we see the figure of the table keeps the same but it's moving from one point to another. So this prototype shows how light could be material. Uh, we, we use the light and the shadow uh, as uh, one material or another, and uh, basically it can create uh, two areas of the space in the same uh, architecture structure. As you can see in the background, uh, the golden color is actually casted by the shadow of the ropes and it, it becomes the material itself. So uh, by changing the scale and the presume of everyday objects and it turns them into mystery forms that want, that want experience inside it makes the world more open in a more creative way of production consumption that might typically associate. Supermarket in today's world is one of the most calcified points of capital society. We challenge how the supply chain of supermarket works and how we watch it. This diagram shows the ecology of market, such as production, delivery, marketing, consumption, storage, recycling, etc. Each thing acts like a floating island, which has its own area of interest, views, and camera positions. So overall, these things are conceptually, are conceptually connected, but each thing is quasi-autonomy. As we are mainly working on the format of film for our cities, we put several cameras to capture the events happening in these supermarket ecology seas. These events are simultaneously watched and recorded by 20 or 30 camera setups in the whole supermarket ecology uh, world. These recording footage clips based on camera views are flattened and sorted in a pool where everything has no hierarchy. We or everyone can reconfigure these clips in a linear timeline. These clips can be rearranged, inserted, trimmed, slided in a non-linear fashion. Finally, Almost a countless digital supermarket film can be generated by anyone. As you can see here, uh, for each color, its island has, uh, for example, three uh, events and uh, three camera positions. Uh, so far, they are hierarchical, but then 
those video clips are uh, put in a video pool, uh, so everyone can cut, can edit it to, to become uh, to generate a final film. Yeah, in the end, the digital supermarket becomes a global cultural phenomenon. Anything, anywhere, anytime, everyone. Thank you for listening. Could you also just talk a little bit, Shin and Yu Ting, about how you imagine the format for the final? I know that's an important part of your thesis, so perhaps just to loop everyone into that as well. Right. So uh, as we can see here, uh, we created uh, like several uh, scenarios, uh, and then there are several cameras for each scenario. Uh, each camera captures one area of interest for that scene, uh, and it generates a footage clip. As you can see here, uh, this is A1, A2, A3 camera. Uh, so uh, after the recording, uh, those video clips will be uh, arranged in a video pool, which has no hierarchy. And we as designer or anyone Did we just lose them? We did, okay. Shin, Yu Ting, we can't hear you just in case you can hear us. Uh, perhaps how you could check and see what's happening. This is a fidgetal experience where I'm sending a real, an, an real life messenger. Yeah, my internet <laughs> to here our... is, is fine. I... Okay, they know it got in with that. Was everyone able to click to the Miro board? The link's in the chat. It should open in a browser. And you can kind of pan around and zoom in and see some of the videos a little more clearly. Um, there's only, um, I only have a Zoom link, uh, Devin. I don't. Oh, is that through the chat? Okay, sorry. In the okay. chat, in the chat. Uh huh. Okay, they're coming back. Welcome back. Hello. 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 Oh, I know. <laughs> you're you're demonstrating the digital environment for us with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we are. We, we don't Where'd know you go? Is, uh, Did you go to the beach there? It looks like you went to the beach. <laughs> 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 okay. All right. Um, we can pick it up if you guys are ready. <laughs> yeah, we also shared the mirror board, so uh, you can uh, visit it uh, through the link in the chat. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, maybe I'll re explain the, our workflow. Uh, so, as you can see on our mirror board, there are four color islands. Uh, so, those islands are 
uh, scenarios we are gonna create. And uh, uh, as you can see for the green one, there are three cameras. Uh, those cameras call it A1, A2, A3. Uh, these cameras are uh, tied to the green C, the CA. Uh, and uh, And the uh, video clips will be generated based on those camera positions. Uh, so far, those video clips are still hierarchical because they are tied to uh, this C. Uh, after, uh, so literally, uh, those video clips will be put in the media pool uh, where all clips are non hierarchical. So uh, we, as designer or everyone, can. Uh, added to those video clips into uh, a so-called digital supermarket film. Basically, it's really a, a collective cultural production of the uh, video. So it really responds to the uh, our topic of the uh, big flat now. It's like an interactive too that uh, everyone can bring the assets from our design and then create based on whatever, whatever they want. Maybe to follow up on what Devin was asking, just it's a question of curiosity. Do you imagine that uh, you will present uh, something that is more like a film or a video of you know, these various cameras sort of working simultaneously and non-hierarchically? Or do you imagine, for example, that uh, somehow the critics or maybe a larger audience that aren't necessarily even there are participating in this uh, scenario you just described? Or I, I'm very curious how you think this thing is going to be sort of communicated more uh, viscerally, more experientially in terms of, it seems like that's the promise of it, but you can confirm that. Um, yeah, we think that uh, our final format is a film that's uh, that's because that's the one version we pick. But actually, uh, the whole supermarket, digital supermarket world will be look like um, like thirty cameras is watching this world, and they are watching everywhere. Um, and actually, it uh, the time and space uh, is like collapse. Mm -hmm. There's no time, no space hierarchy. So, uh, like everyone can watch anywhere at the same time. Mm -hmm. That is our main purpose. Um, and like, like we said, the uh, film will be edited. That is uh, only for the final version mm -hmm. that we want to show uh, what this world will work. Mm -hmm. So we will make a film of that. Yeah, in short, it's like uh, we create a, a world utilizing our uh, idea of the digital spatial interface. Uh, and there are a lot of cameras, just like a CCTV surveillance cameras. And there are a lot of video clips from those camera positions. And uh, we can edit those clips and everyone can also edit those clips in order to generate uh, uh, whatever film they want. And they can also tweak the, for example, how they want to combine objects and the digital techniques to create, uh, as we talked about the, the four Cs. So, so okay. Shin, um, just so I, I'm hoping that everyone can maybe make a picture in their head of what this will look like. It's almost like our Zoom board right now where there's a large grid or a, kind of a matrix and several videos are playing at the same time. Is that correct? And then each video has some content and the kind of content that you're at least demonstrating here on the storyboard is somewhat related uh, to a supermarket that we might think of, but it's mostly related to techniques of representation that you're interested in exploring. So there's like a grid, many cameras, all showing objects doing something at the same time, possible user mm, interaction with that, a, fi a final, a director's cut of this movie um, and that perhaps more scenes will come um, about other things that I know you had discussed about um, things related to food and waste and um, agricultural production, pretty much everything one could imagine is the ecology around a supermarket. 
right? That's kind of the yeah. dream of, of where, where you're that, going, right? I'm glad that you're mentioning that because I'm trying to figure it out. I, actually, my question was why a supermarket? Because I couldn't understand why why a supermarket and why not something else. And, and so... So to a certain extent, I mean, it's really intriguing this kind of this notion of of of, of interface, and uh, but uh, I'm 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 trying to picture in my mind uh, the the interface between um, the real person at the in a, in the supermarket and somebody who is uh, at home sitting in front of a computer, right? And 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 so that so that's. That's what I'm trying to. I mean, I, I guess that's what you're trying to uh, uh, to design is this kind of uh, digital uh, really. Uh, um, I call it a relationship. So, but uh, but as I'm looking at this and I'm, I'm I'm trying to understand whether is it educational? Is it uh, for a um, uh, commercial purpose? Um, because I think to a certain extent it will it 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 it, it will change because educational me would mean um, there is a, um, a a different purpose of informing in, in, mm -hmm. as opposed to advertising. I I I would see those two being very very different, and and I think the message that come across would be part of your thesis, would it not? Yeah, I think it's more like a cultural, cultural practice. We are not designing something final product. We are designing the workflow that everyone can uh, go through based on our workflow and they can design whatever they want. They can generate uh, content they want. And the reason why we choose supermarket is uh, the first one is that we want to play with uh, something that we are super familiar with. So, and supermarkets mm. give us a lot of assets. So that's mm -hmm. the first reason. The second one is uh, we think that, um, especially like our in quarantine time, we think like a shopping experience can be kind of different. Maybe not shop, shop in the store, not shop online, but it's like combined way. That's what we said, it's like digital experience. It will be much better than online or in store. Also the form of the uh, supermarket objects are very familiar for us. So we are able to uh, defamiliarization those uh, familiar objects and uh, creating like uh, ambiguous effect. I love this idea. Oh, go ahead. I love this idea. I think it's fantastic. To me, the only thing I think is in your scenes right now, I didn't understand that until Devin told me that it was all about the supermarket. I couldn't tell. Yeah. So you need to make it more about the supermarket. But I think it's That's a right. idea. But I, I think the something you could think about the supermarket is there's like, there's like carnal things. There's like meat, right? And there's like vegetable things. It, it's like I don't want to buy a rotten apple. I want to buy like a beautiful apple. Maybe it should be organic. Maybe it doesn't have a worm. You know, um, I think if I'm going to buy, I don't know, coffee, uh, there's freshness. So some things are packaged, but some things are all about their freshness. And um, somehow that would be nice to start to address. Right. Uh, they've been unloading a lot of wormy apples of late. <laughs> <laughs> Bottles of wine, please. Bottles of wine. Alcohol, yeah. <laughs> I mean, one, one thing is that uh, I think it's really a good choice, and we said this in the earlier review, of uh, that the supermarket is the subject. On one hand, you can imagine that every market is like every other market in that architecturally they're not engaging. Um, and then in fact, they're overwhelmed by the presentation of the products and the kind of experience of fluorescent lighting and all of the other things that go along with it. So I like the idea in a way that right now it seems like the active design is in the presentation techniques, 
the uh, conflation of the digital and the physical to be digital, um, and that uh, the presentation of it is something that is uh, immersive in a lot of ways. And so it's much more dwelling in design as product design uh, and perhaps in kind of really specific industrial design. And there's a sort of um, combination of seduction and immersion that's going on in that. And, and I think the more you push those things together, the better. Um, and I can imagine why this doesn't want to become a kind of architectural problem about the space yeah, in the really container, yeah. but more about the kind of experience of it and the sensation of it. So considering how much time you have left, I would really expect that you would go full tilt on making these uh, various uh, immersive uh, cinemagraphic clips um, that they each one is compelling. And then when they are put together, it's uh, immersive is the best word I can use right now, but that it has some of those qualities that's less didactic and more absolutely sensual. The, the kind of blinking, you know, strawberry cans is probably one example of that uh, as something that becomes intriguing at some level because it's cl a collapse uh, between the two things you're interested in, these two things that are usually discreet. Um, I would like to imagine that you're going to put all your effort into that kind of uh, video film presentation you're describing. Yeah, I mean, I just saw in chat Peter's, Peter was saying content versus experience. And I think, I think to me, the, the, the experience uh, is actually going to be infused with the content, meaning that uh, if, if, if you're going to do a supermarket, I mean, there is nothing more immediate than food because you can think about a tomato being really juicy and you can think about, you know, going near the fish counter where it's either smell really fishy or it doesn't. But, but, but there is something about food that that is always represented and it's always presented in a, the most luscious way that to make you want to buy everything, even though you may not be hungry, you may, you may not want to do that. So, so I, I, I would say that that experience that you're doing, um, I think it's, it's, it's almost like if, if, if the user are able to interface, uh, the, the user, in, the, the, who are interfacing this may be either act, actually at the, at, the, at the supermarket or not, and then they are able to convey that experience for you in a digital way. So digital means it's one is feeling much closer and less removed from the experience. Those are those are really great comments. Um, if anyone has any any more thoughts, otherwise we're going to. Uh, continue on. We're of course behind, but that's just. Uh, if I can make just one how quick, it goes. Of course, one Kristen, quick comment. Please. I'll keep it quick. Um, I I love the I guess artifacts that you presented in that. I don't I don't know that I understand the entire scope of um, how you're envisioning this moving forward. But I I just wanted to mention that. It, some of some of the items reminded me a little bit of augmented reality, just in terms of like how the digital can map onto physical objects and kind of become something new. And I think that's interesting, but I, I also think that you guys have the potential to really push that further, um, not just augmented reality, not just like the digital kind of mapping onto, onto physical, but really that interface the play between the two so it really really does become something new um, I think some of the uh, videos that you have right now are just on that cusp uh, of being something that's not um, that really is I think what you're aiming to get at digital um, and so if it really becomes an interface where people can kind of assert their own influence into that realm I would try to, I don't know if I make clear, but like what are the what are the parameters that you're looking at that really make something digital versus like a kind of augmented reality or a kind of mapped digital onto physical object? What really pushes that boundary path so that um, we get there? 
I think it would just be nice to have that clear in your thesis as you present forward. I think that's a great comment because it also has to do with the user being more passive versus more active. And, and I, I would love to see not necessarily like a set of instructions, like how someone could use the supermarket in some ways that maybe would be a kind of natural navigation. But I, I really like that comment. And I, I, I think it's in line with what you Ting and Shin are interested in. So I think on that note, we're going to um, hand it over to Julia. Thank you, Shin. Thank you, Yu Ting. Thank you. Thank you. I, thank you. And, and welcome to Marika. That's exactly right. Welcome to Marika. Hello. Hi, guys. Do you know Kristen? Kristen, Marika, Marika, no, Kristen. I don't. I don't think we've met. Hi, Kristen. Nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you as well. <laughs> Marika teaches in the his and coordinates the history theory um, department at SciArc, and she's also um, advising the students. So, in addition to their the students' advisors, they also have a special history theory advisor. So, Marika's been uh, working with us these past several months. So, um, thanks, Marika, for dropping in. <laughs> All right, Julia, take it away. Hi everyone, um, can you hear me okay? Um, okay, so my name is Julia Pike and my thesis topic is called Street Style. Um, let me make sure this is just high quality. Okay, so throughout the past few years, the term street style has gained popularity in describing a new comprehensive approach to fashion where styles intersect and deviate from mainstream considerations. Street style is based on individualism and can demonstrate multiple identities as well as utilize subcultures and trends. The origins of street style, which date back to post-World War II, can be linked to the desire to express meaningful intention and seek authenticity. The rise of mass marketing, suburbanization, franchising restaurants and retail chains, as well as the spread of television and social media, have increased the appeal of alternate lifestyles. In the same way that clothing and accessories can be used to express an individual's persona, this thesis posits that architecture can be used to reflect and enhance the urban identity. Identity is an essential goal for a good urban environment. Within a city, a healthy urban environment should encourage people to express themselves and become involved. People should feel that some part of the environment belongs to them individually and collectively. So a desire to respond and care for a space emerges whether they own it or not. New developments are usually created using a monotonous and standard image. The consequence being buildings that are designed with little care for their relationship to the surrounding area and their overall effect to the city. Spaces between them are usually left undefined, undesirable and useless. By mobilizing new modes of digi digital collaboration, this thesis will explore alternate forms of urbanism and encourage participation in development starting from spaces left undefined. In 1972, Rainer Bannum changed the world's perception of Los Angeles by touring LA with the help of a made up cassette guide, Beta Car. In Rainer Bannum Loves Los Angeles, he celebrated the city's quirkiness while simultaneously criticizing its lack of public access. Bannum highlighted the unique value of Los Angeles as a constellation of urban villages that make nonsense of history and break all the rules. The documentary brings light to Los Angeles' lack of central identity, its power to influence, and the main constant of the city, its ability to change. Street Style seeks to follow suit by showcasing Los Angeles' multiple identities using existing architectural elements combined with new tools for design. In this thesis, an updated version of Apple's Siri will take me through Los Angeles, helping me identify spatial opportunities and identity creation. Street Style begins with an AR app that enables participatory design within interstitial urban spaces. Placing chunks of local architecture and public space into the hands of passerbyers, Street Style enables the public to curate and connect underutilized urban islands. By connecting isolated parts of LA, the app enables pathways for disapparated cultures to interact and co-create. Street Style allows the layman to act as a legitimate designer outlining future um, city planning goals. It accelerates the path to a healthy urban solution by assuming the input of passerbyers into an ever-changing urban archipelago. Through repetition, scale, and deletion, participants can play with local architectural elements on site. 
These elements are collected by the users themselves and consist of 3D chunks of Los Angeles's built culture. Street style demonstrates and accelerates the interplay of LA's urban architectural identities. It seeks a new comprehensive approach to urbanism where shared culture can naturally coagulate, differentiate from the norm in populist defined directions. So this is just kind of showing the example of the app and it will end on what my background is right now, which are just gathered architectural um, inspired details. That was great, Julia. Do you want to maybe tell us a little bit about these architectural details that are floating behind you? Yeah, um, Thanks. let me move on. So um, these details were initially found through my exploration of the city um, and kind of the beta testing version of what I believe um, this uh, street style app can become. In the future, I plan on creating um, separate architectural lookbooks based off of other people's kind of um, design aesthetics and architectural details and uh, having a collection of kind of different um, styles and aesthetics to play with and combined on site. Um, this thesis kind of began with the idea of Rainer Banham Loves Los Angeles and exploring LA in new fashions um, in an updated 2020 version. So I wanted to speculate on like what these leftover spaces um, or spaces in between development could possibly be and um, utilize kind of a creative, funny way to, to postulate on that. I think your presentation is really nice, Julia. Um, it was really clear what the what the aim is. Um, a question I have is how what your position is on, um, I guess, the interface between other users. So I could walk up to a site that I see that is under underutilized. I put in some thing. Can somebody else come over and say, "Hey, I see that thing that you made. I'm going to add." to this, or we're going to add to existing buildings to see what we can do there. Yeah. yeah, the idea was kind of to come from a upcycling adaptive reuse sort of location um, where these details can kind of, uh, there'll be some kind of skeleton slash structure that is laid onto the site initially and the, co uh, the community at, at large kind of edits and um, builds onto that to kind of create, um, yeah, coagulation of design aesthetics. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, I, I really love your presentation too. And, and, and I was just thinking about this. I said, this is a, 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 an incredible app if you were really truly going to be developing it because the, <laughs> because the, idea, the idea that one could use an app and uh, and and have a, um, uh, a a a kind of a whole collection of of of, of LA details, and um, and then can start uh, using it, but not only doing that, but. Um, uh, give uh, give it to say a, a the community or the neighborhood group to to play with right so so I think it, it's kind of a um, um, the, the, it, it seems very idealistic to kind of hand back the design of a um, of a um, empty uh, uh, 
piece of land uh, back to back to the community and and for them for, for that to decide it and and the reason why I'm, I'm saying that it's it's an incredible app is you know we we all know how um, design uh, how a community is um, very active in terms of how they wanted their neighborhood to uh, to look like uh, but but my 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 question is there's also a little bit of a kind of a um, additive and slightly exquisite corpse idea behind not really knowing what the outcome is going to be because of the app is allowing you to um, to do that. I'm, I'm, I'm curious, was that something very much in your mind to have a thesis that it's it's an open end this you know in other words the the, the end product is very open-ended it's not one where we have a determined outlook to that um because it's a very strong position in terms of thesis uh, yeah that you're taking on yeah um initially in thesis prep i found a really amazing company called um free lots los angeles that basically gives a neighborhood could submit to kind of have a community garden on one of these lots and take over these empty lots and i really grabbed on to that idea that um these underutilized spaces that are just kind of hanging out and being empty could actually give something back to the community. Um, but as I've been developing, developing my thesis, I definitely think that um, there needs to be some sort of hierarchy to the, the level of design input that's allowed. Um, and I'm kind of, I'm excited and also nervous to sort of explore that further um, when I start to accept other people's um, design input on it as well. <laughs> But right now it's just a film. So uh, I think that there'll be an underhanded effect of design aesthetics. Um, and that's why I kind of clarified at the end that sort of through repetition, scale and deletion that these objects can kind of develop because I think there needs to be some ground rules or some rules set in how the mm -hmm. app actually interacts. Right, like uh, if, you, if, you, if, if, you, if you pick the wrong detail on the app, it just say, nope. Yeah, it's like you've used too many of these. <laughs> yeah. I love your idea. Um, I love your uh, I was, what I've been thinking about is why do they need to be objects? Um, because uh, if I think of Rainer Bainham, I think of the four ecologies and those are all based on four different ground planes, you might say. So it's the beach, it's the freeways, it's the flatlands and it's the foothills. So I wonder if you could, start thinking a little more about the ecologies. And one nice thing about ecology is it already changes. So if you're interested in a changing effect, if you engage mm -hmm. landscape, uh, that is ever changing. Do you know, landscape grows. Uh, mm -hmm. So I wonder about like, there's different qualities about beach or freeways or flatlands or foothills. So how could I input in from different locations? And I don't know, does that create any kind of cross fertilization eventually? Like, are, can you first identify four ecologies and then mix them up or, I, I don't know. I think you could hearken back to actually his four ecologies and mm -hmm. uh, maybe think about sometimes if an object is grounded or if the object is the ground plane. Well, I mean, ground plane is sometimes the object. Uh, but yeah. I love your whole skit and the way that you, like the, I, I think there's two parts to your thesis. One is how you're telling the story and the other is the thing that you're doing. And I find that also fascinating that you can have both of those things. Uh, so I think you can keep going. Thank you. Julia, based on where you were when I saw your work last week and what you just presented, I mean, Congratulations, that was, a, <laughs> that was a triumph. I don't even know how you got from there to here um, because that represents an enormous step of clarif clarifying 
your thinking, clarifying your language, even clarifying your uh, your your formal language, the whole thing. So I just am so excited for you now that you have mm -hmm. such a consolidated um, and fresh <clears throat> fresh position. I will say I agree with Margaret that. Um, maybe limiting yourself to things that you can add on the site is maybe uh, too limiting for the full, the full range of ways that you can think about what street style might really mean. Um, if you could play more with things that could be taken away, so things that could be poured out, um, if you could play, if you could move away from simply follies, I think that could be really interesting. I've always been a little bit alarmed by the kind of weak activism that seems to assume that community gardens in empty lots is in any way sufficient to addressing the inequities of the various neighborhoods in Los Angeles or other regions, other urban regions in the United States or the world. And so I'm pleased to see that you're thinking about forms that go beyond that enrichment of the this, this single ground plane. But at the same time, it makes me wonder what if you could really think big? What if you could really imagine what would be the highest and best use of a particular site? How could you then distribute that in an app format? I think these are really fascinating points and um, I'm just, I, I don't wanna take up the, our guest time, but I, I just wanna encourage Jill Julia to explore those like Margaret's point about things that are not objects. I was just imagining in the app, you could have trees that are growing and at different you know, points in their life cycle or even thinking really big like Marika was saying about the role of waste that we never really see or that's tried to be covered up. Because one, one of the, I think, amazing aspects about AR is that you can show us something that appears to be there, but isn't actually there. And through that there's, and this comes back a little bit, I think to Kristen, um, her point earlier that like you can use that in some kind of either instructional way or informative way to imagine, like visualize how much waste this block is actually producing. Mm -hmm. And without, you know, the trash sitting literally on the sidewalk and through some of these kinds of, um, just impactful imagery, I, I can imagine it would hopefully help uh, start conversations. Imagine if um, the, the, the water or the power or these other kinds of truly ecological um, aspects of the city, imagine if the cars weren't here. Um, th those are kind of, you know, that's the deletion side. Like, I think those are real, I think those are real opportunities to engage us in the city and the street in, in very, very new ways. And, um, and, and I totally agree like that aren't just about sort of adding objects but are really empowering mm -hmm. people to envision what their city could be with more of something which could be bad or less of something which could be potentially good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, no, I, 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 I just really... want, oh, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead, no. Peter. I, um, just, I, I'll only be a second um, really fast. Uh, Julia, fantastic, really great. Uh, and I so agree with everything that's being said, but also to answer Marika's question, I think that your the review we had last week was pretty catalytic. Um, and these things have been brewing, obviously. This didn't come out of nowhere. This was stuff that Julia had in her back pocket that she's been carrying, or in her back, pack sack, or in her car trunk, I don't know where, but she's been carrying <laughs> this stuff around. So, uh, fantastic, yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, I, 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 I agree with every, you know, all of the comment, and, the, and if you st start thinking about ecology, you know, when, when Raina Bannum did the fall ecology, that was a very different Los Angeles than now. I think now we have many more than just four ecologies. So, and, and you could also think about it in terms of micro ecologies as opposed to a larger region, uh, because you you're talking about a small community. And, and, and the, the other thing that, that I think that you got hung up on was because you, you title your whole uh, uh, film and everything by using the term street styles. And then the styles end up being kind of 
uh, translate into you know this kind of style objects and all of that, and 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 that and I, I, you may want to rethink how you're presenting this because it's 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 beyond just style itself. Mm -hmm. Great, great points, everyone. Thank you, Julia. That was fantastic. <laughs> All right, we're going to switch over to Hal, but I wanted to just ask our jury, would they like a five minute break? With that, shall we do five minutes and come back at, yes, mm -hmm. Margaret's saying yes. yes. So let's take five minutes. We'll pause and come back at just like 325. Thanks okay. everyone, thank you.
Hi, everyone. We're good. Everyone's back. Who are we missing? Margaret and Ming. Oh, Margaret's, I think, coming back. Thanks, Hal, for your patience. Okay, great. Uh, Hal, would you like to take it away? Yes, yeah, sure. Thank you. Okay, I put my mirror board address in the chat, so if you want to check. Hello, everyone. I'm Hao, and my thesis in school needs school out. My thesis begins from this image, a typical typology of classroom, blackboard, and a teacher in front of desks and chairs in a single direction, single perspective, and a single focus. Current situation and the remote learning experience open a new discussion about school typology. However, since we cannot go back to school for a long time, then we put ourselves in a poor situation with collective failure of imagination. Apart from the way we already know, how can we make a breakthrough to our pedagogy space? In terms of perspective, it is something literally that tied to pedagogy, like a single point of view. The way we are seeing develops the way and architectural space in which we are learning. This reminded me of the perspective system. All the digital tools we are using today, like Rhino, Cinema 4D, are based on the Western perspective system. No matter for the perspective view or the parallel view, Everything is precisely measured, predictable, and a single perspective. Is there a new model to break the system and remake our world to respond to the condition? Yes, let's jump to the Eastern way of seeing, the Chinese girl painting. So those images come from the film Day on the Grand Canal with the Emperor of China by David Hockney. He mentioned some interesting techniques here. First is the scroll painting itself. The viewer could control the edge as, as they want, which means we can, we can decide where we want to look, how wide the printing is. It is an endless format to some point. The second is a multiple perspective. Based on the paper, the viewers could put multiple perspectives together in one frame. That's why we can see the both sides of the two houses at the same place or that's why we can see the different perspective point overlay between the foreground and the background. Next is about scale. Long time ago, Chinese painting are not affected by the Western perspective system. As you can see, we have the perspective distance here, but the people's scale dimension keep the same. Next is about the abundance of information in the painting. As you can see, because of the complexity of space organization, architecture elements, and the narrative scenes, the viewers could decide where he want to see. The viewer's eye is strolling around the painting. And everything, all the elements, all happens together at once. The last thing is about the cloud boundary. Chinese painter would like to use the cloud line in the painting for them to transfer from the one scene to the other, or from one time to the other. So based on that, I think there is a new model of pedagogy and a spatial space with multiple perspective, multi-experience community comes out. Micro school. It's a community based on two or three family members at their backyard, where the parents could solve the education crisis on their own. The posters are some concept test I made and put them all together in the vertical traditional Chinese painting. Micro school is a good way to rethink about relationship between multi-object and multi-subject. School ingredients are relocated in different scale, different perspective and composition at a different backyard. I see this as an open and imaginative guide to promote and promote new ways of schooling. Everyday objects are designed and set in a new way of seeing. Instead, the school is the place where you will go. School becomes the things you do, the thing you have to do collectively, the thing you have to do in the community. 
This is a digital square format. Micro square units at different backyard displays in the 3D digital square. Sometimes they are displayed in different ways to look at the same thing. Sometimes it varies from different widths of edge, like the scroll painting. Move the camera back first, you will see all the scale or the perspective at the backstage or the scenes or happen at once. So this animation shows the new way to look at all of them together as a digital scroll painting format. The scenes are swiped back and forth by the camera movement to show different scenes in fragment way. Since it's in digital space, I begin to flop and drop some objects, trying to overcome the fixed background, single scale or single vantage point. It is possible to trigger discussion, what is ground, what is a background, what is a background in pictorial space, and what is the relationship between a pictorial background and the actual ground of an architecture projects. Okay, so the last image is some possible um, steps for the future. So I want to try some digital landscape based on the image in the future, as the boundary of the scene could be blurred, like the cloud in the Chinese scroll painting. It brings a certain flatness, and the digital, or the digital and the physical qualities could image together, and treat them as a tool to pop out more digital qualities into the physical environment. I saw scroll painting gave me a specific way to see the multi-perspective, object and subject, strangeness and familiarness all together as a strategy to rebuild our pedagogy environment. Thank you. Could you zoom in on a couple of those scenes at the end in the last piece? The last image. Those are some strategies I will work in the future to um, merge more things about the digital quality and the physical quality together. But um, be, uh, before that, there is all like, I'm trying to find their way of seeing in the traditional Chinese scroll painting to treat our uh, pedagogy environment with multiple perspective, multiple scenes together. And so, um, and I also think the digital scroll painting in a new way in digital space, it's not just a way of seeing or it's not just a way of representation, but it's a new way to design our space. One thing that I really love about your project is the animated scroll as a format. I feel like that is a really strong format, but I think what you could do is it shouldn't be purple in the back. It should be in the back should be, you know, your clouds. Uh, and then you could sometimes zoom out a little and see more clouds and see more of these scenes above and sometimes zoom in but I think that you could use like zooming out and zooming in a little bit across this um, scroll, but emphasize the scroll. Like I love the idea of like your whole thing, it's only a scroll, that's it. Um, but it, you zoom in and zoom out so the scroll can do everything. Like it's gonna really be much bigger than just a scroll. It's like a, a scroll in all directions, maybe. Uh, I don't know. I, I think the scroll part of what you're done and the dropping things in is fantastic too. But I think like the, the background is the next consideration on the scroll. Uh, yeah, I think uh, because I, I want to put some elements of the traditional scroll painting into a new way. So yeah, I like, I like the point that you talk about is uh, zooming and zoom out, which is corresponds to my uh, this situation like if you have a lot of information together, so you can, okay, I want to look at the down part or I want to look at the up part. I can zoom in, zoom out, go wherever I want. I think this is a, a fantastic way to bring them to, back to the digital space. Yeah, I like, mm -hmm. I love the idea. Yeah. 
Um, I, I have a question. Is there a particular age group for this school? Are you talking about changing education? Is it not high education or just education in general? Uh, I think it is, um, I'm trying to do is find a develop a new typology of um, pedagogy based on the digital tool and the exchange of the culture, the Western and the Chinese culture. Um, because I think um, my duty is to bring a new possibility of format uh, and how the people would use that. Like if the high high level, or like the high school students could use that or like the middle school, uh, middle students won't use that. It depends mm -hmm. on the user. But my, mm. as a designer, my duty is to bring this possibility to them. Okay. Yeah. Is the, is the ultimate outcome of this physical or digital? Uh, uh, actually, um, I can say both, but in the, <laughs> in the end, in the end, everything will pop out as like, you know, uh, it's like every day object could appear in everyone's backyard. So um, I just use our digital tool. You can treat it as a handbook like to demonstrate how people could use this object at their backyard, how the new way of studying happens in their backyard. But in the end, it's a collection, bring all of these things together, have our um, scroll painting quality. But um, in the process of popping things out, I want to bring some digital qualities from the digital interface, pop them up into the physical world. Um. Yeah, I'm not sure about that yet because um, what you presented in a way, I, I was following along, I had a similar question about uh, the kind of literal form this would take. But it seems like right now remote learning is a challenge to work with, uh, you know, particular platforms that are probably so nascent and crude that we don't know what the potential of remote learning is yet. And in a way, when you moved into uh, a digital environment about learning. And it seemed like you're asking the question, what can representation in the Chinese art pieces that you showed us and the kind of aspects of that bring to the understanding of, of a very visual mode of learning that is purely digital because the digital can capture the thing that you're asking about in a way that maybe the physical cannot. Um, I'm afraid that if you try to translate it back into an environment of a backyard or otherwise, that it becomes a kind of cacophony of things again that doesn't have that sense of framing or enabling a way of seeing something that's different than it is when you're simply in that physical environment. Um, it's a question I have about the thesis also, just because it seems like you're on to an idea about a pedagogy that comes from what seems like a liability at this point, but you're turning it into an asset. And, and I find that interesting. I'm not sure it applies so uh, effectively when you sort of try to put it back into the physical realm of you know, being in an environment like a backyard. It's, it's more of a question than, than a criticism. You know, there's uh, there's something really interesting about your project, and 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 you uh, uh, the, the the scroll that you're showing in terms of the animation of going along, you know, the, uh, reminds me of how Chinese opera used to be, right, in the old time when you have a scene along the street and you can just walk along and you kind of see the, the story evolve. So what, so I, by, by the way, I really love the way you are presenting and, and describing your project and explaining, uh, you know, the multiple perspective and analyzing the, the, the Chinese scroll. And, but the, there's a difference between being in control of looking uh, the a Chinese painting because your eyes can wander and you can decide where where to look at like the multiple perspective and you can you know but whereas here um, there is a sequence which um, 
which is being captivated because there's a time, you know, you go from point A to one, point B, from right to left. And, and um, but I think the fact that you are add, that you're having the movement of, of, of the object or of the content coming in as you move, as you're scrolling from right to left, I think is really, really, really wonderful because it added another dimension to it. So it's not just a static, uh, um, uh, uh, way of, of giving out the information because you're giving it uh, uh, more dimensionality and, and you, you are adding more information to that. So I think that that part is really fantastic. Um, but I'm, but, but I'm, I'm just wondering in terms of, and the reason why I was asking about, uh, about the age group, because I think, I think it would, I think it would be really helpful to for you to position yourself to say there are different ways of of um, providing um, uh, you know of, of of teaching of of, of providing the, the information and and that the content itself, I, which I think is absolutely important in in this situation. Uh, does not feel like I look at this and I feel this is for for a certain age group because there's a kind of a playfulness to that, right? And 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 what I'm seeing is um, in, in is a combination of uh, 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 activities which could be recreational activity. Uh, and at the same time, activities which has to do with being uh, a learning environment, and I think those two, if I if uh, I think combining those two, I think is very rich for the experience. So I, I I like the fact that education is not just a serious way of learning, but that education is uh, forget about the backyard for a moment because I I, I don't believe in the, in the backyard or the physical. I mean, let's just stay with the digital for now. Um, but but that but that the but but that the learning is not a linear way. I think that's really absolutely crucial and I think that there's something about your project that I think if you emphasize more and more in terms of like okay it's not linear and it's not sequential I think if you can break through that I think that would be really fantastic and I think you're kind of halfway there okay um, I, I think there's definitely um so yeah, the, the Reggio Emilia yeah, I would, I would. <laughs> um, method of, of teaching as play and learning as play is definitely a sort of a, a friend to your project. Um, I think this is one of the things that makes this project powerful is it shows a lot of times people assume in architecture at least that if something is digital, it is somehow less real or less impactful. And one of the ways that your project flips that on its head and this is why I agree with the comments of the other critics that there's something to be gained by keeping it digital, is it becomes a pure resource of imagination. So there are gonna be all kinds of ridiculously stressed out parents. I mean, even if we just take this as its most practical and strip a lot of the, the additional delight away for a second, there are gonna be all kinds of stressed out parents, myself included, um, very shortly trying to figure out how the heck to turn our backyards into a place of learning. Um, and the, the, having this be a kind of exuberant digital experience is almost like providing a kind of um, rich, um, even endless imaginative surplus that's available um, as a way to rethink how we think of education, as Ming was saying, how to rethink how we think of backyard space, how we think of communities, how we think of, uh, of the way that our shared outside air um, is going to be uh, um, a recalibrated um, and uh, 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 
how to put it, revalued in our COVID time and beyond. So because of all those things, it's almost like you don't need to say, I'm going to test this in a particular place. It can live as this kind of rich digital scroll. Um, and it can actually have more of an impact than if it were to somehow land, which is awesome and I think rare. I yeah, agree. I, Those are the, oh, sorry. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Kristen. No, please. Oh, I was just gonna. I was just gonna say. I think that a lot of what you said in this presentation has really um, is really exciting. I specifically love this image that we're kind of landed on right now. The one with the the um, three dimensional space that has the purple frames in front, um, and the space is kind of ever changing depending on which perspective you're viewing it from. This long image here, um, in terms of an accessible digital architecture that allows for imagine, imaginative play and inquiry and also allows you to kind of see these different perspectives all at the same time. Like I can actually imagine um, that, and I think it is happening, you know, each of these frames that you're seeing all around are coming from this kind of one model in different perspectives and different views, different ways of seeing it. Um, I have I have a, an incoming kindergartner this year who's going to be taught remotely, and I'm stressed out about it. Um, if this was a way of like, if, if this was like something that was presented to me as like, here's your child's classroom, they can explore that classroom and in all of these different places can learn something new about um, uh, whatever topic that they're looking at. It becomes a kind of new way of understanding the world. And because it is all, you know, everyday objects, it's accessible to children. Um, I think that that's really exciting because it's, it's offering a new space um, and especially for children um, who maybe need a little bit of extra, you know, a, a kindergartner cannot do Zoom, right? Like we can do Zoom, but they can do something like this. They can play games. They can do interactive uh, spatial things. And so I think you're really onto something here. I would just stick with the digital. I mean, I, I, would, I would really push into that and say that this can actually change our perception of space while remaining digital. I totally, uh, I have to say, I think these are great comments and really welcome at this stage. Um, and I think how you've done an amazing job to get this far at midterm. So this is really exciting. Uh, I also think that the staying in the digital, what this suggests is I actually think we're in a kind of post digitality here. Um, that we finally arrive somewhere we've been hoping to get to for 10 years or more. Um, and that we're starting to really sense that in projects like this one. Uh, and uh, I, it's just really exciting. I also, just to answer to, to coming back to something uh, that uh, Ming was saying earlier also, I think that the playfulness, I like the doubles, obviously I like the doubles robots uh, tennis robots, <laughs> but, um, but, <laughs> uh, but in general, uh, I think that the zooming in, zooming out is also going to add a whole nother spectrum to this. Um, so yeah, I think it's a wonderful project really. Well, I was just going to say, it depends on your ambition and the amount of time you have left, but if you follow the advice of remaining in the digital, I, I think one way to get it out of just the idea of an observer observing a piece of work uh, and understanding a different way of seeing things. I think that's extremely important. That's the basis for starting. But both of our children went to Montessori schools and the idea that uh, is prevalent in that is that everyone already knows is that, you know, you, you choose in the room what you want to work with. Children do, they're not told to work with A, a versus B. And then when they do that, it's a, a kind of well-designed game that requires them to investigate it. And there's a lot of their own initiative and in how it's handled. And I was just thinking if there's a dimension, I mean, Devin on the chat mentioned East, you know, the Easter egg idea on gaming. 
um, that, you know, there would be moments when something else would open up and there would be a kind of moment of engagement and then you can leave it, but there's a, an idea of choice in it. It's not so kind of directed, uh, it's self-directed. I mean, I think those are building on, you know, concepts that come from back in the Montessori days when that started, uh, but it's being made in a kind of contemporary fashion that works with the idea of remote learning. That's pretty interesting because it, on one hand, maintains this idea of play, play that Ming was talking about, but on the other hand, is sort of doing it in an entirely different realm. And it's allowing this sort of simultaneity of things that one might not get if they were in a physical space. So those are the sort of positive aspects of the thing that I want to see you maybe design some of those interfaces if, if, if that's in the realm of possibility. And if you could design those by next week, that would be great. But I just I, I just have one last comment he because will, I was I was thinking I was he thinking will. about this because you're talking about digital world and I think one of the really wonderful things that you're proposing here, which is you're doing something and you're showing something which is really physical, right? Because you know you can study and then in the playground and then you have a kind of a tennis court right next to it, which in reality that's what we in that's what we are used to in the digital world is that we are used to be able to be in multiple environment and you can look at two screens at the same time and it's two very different things and you're actually putting that you know in in there as a kind this is like digital but look at this is also a physical world I think that's something you wanted to hold on to because I think that's really wonderful about the, your thesis is that you are, you are saying that yeah Great. These are fantastic comments and how we are really excited and quite um, impressed with how you've brought everything together. This is well done and um, a lot of a lot of actually, I, I would say, um, potential here for this, as was being suggested, to even be um, a kind of an interface for parents. And uh, I would say that the, the question about um, being completely digital is is also maybe um, to be considered in reverse, meaning you could still scan like a like a parent could scan, um, you know, with an iPhone or something their backyard and bring real elements into this. So you might have a collapse um, of some real space or familiar space, and then also elements that are um, you know oddly scaled. Um, soccer balls and tennis courts and things. So I, I can imagine not only bringing through uh, scanning or you know photogrammetry some so-called real elements into the space, but if we had children maybe a little older than kindergartners, although they probably are already onto this right now, um, you know you could you could also add a virtual reality component to it, and it would be a pretty incredible like real. Im non-real, virtual, backyard, familiar, and a new teaching tool. And I, I just love the idea that um, that I think has been described and how, and Peter and I have kind of talked about it, but now I feel like even more like this should be part of your presentation that the that it can be a, a tool or an interface and it's not just a, an inspiration, but it actually can become uh, engaged, like like you actually could make this uh, as an entrepreneur, like you could make this something. I, I, I think it's really fascinating. Um, so well done. Um, but just one last point. I just wanted <laughs> along those lines, just is so exciting to come back to what Marika was saying also, that I do think that the, there's a provocation here with the backyard, just to suggest that the backyard has a, a critical edge to it here, I think, that it also challenges the parents and challenges the community to start rethinking property, boundaries of property, the idea that we're these nuclear families and so forth. I think a lot of that is put into question through this. And I think the scroll painting coming from a collective culture, the Chinese, you know, traditional culture is also something that's about community in a different way. And I think that's really, there is a very strong critical edge in this project if you see it that way as well. And I wouldn't give that up. Yeah, I to thank you for saying that, Peter. I totally agree. I think that's actually one of the things that needs to really be foregrounded in the final 
when this project is presented in its, in its ultimate triumph and glory. Um, it really has to be framed um, in, with its social implications um, because they are meaningful and they are imaginative. And the project is critical in the best sense of the word in that it pushes us outside of comfortable and lazy assumptions about the way things are and toward the kind of radicality that is in fact within all of our reach. You know, these are things, these are objects. This is a new relationship with things and objects that breaks down old assumptions about subjectivity. And as you said, um, what constitutes public and private, what constitutes neighbor versus family, et cetera, et cetera. And now more than ever, this makes this project topical and urgent and important. Well said, thank you. Thank you everyone, thank you Hao. And now we're going to hand it over to Jesse. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm going to share my screen. That was an amazing discussion. I pretty much, you know, I don't, I don't have to go. That's like so much better than maybe what I could make. Um, that was super awesome. Um, so if you, if you don't mind, I'm actually going to, um, Stop sharing my video. If you like, um, feel free to um, come in full screen, you know, turn off your split view mode, you know, hide the little presenter window. Uh, this, this presentation is really um, an attempt to just kind of try to um, provide uh, sort of some breathing room and some space for some of these interfaces that we have. Um, don't worry, I'll be joining you uh, shortly I'm here. Um, so, uh, thank you. I started my thesis research by looking into our interfaces, specifically the ways interfaces separate functions, information, commands, and images spatially onto the screen, the page, and the workspace. Here's a familiar uh, Revit interface, uh, Rhino, uh, Katia, um, a kind of home management interface, of course, Twitter and Instagram. To look at it another way, interfaces are a radical way of entangling the body into the work we do as architects. As we navigate living through an epoch changing moment and embrace the challenge of it to the fullest, we quickly find we are in desperate need of fresh ideas. Here are some images of the open air school movement in the early 20th century. Look how radical these classrooms are. On the beach, under a bridge, in a roofless space, on a hill, in a forest, in a garden, in the local LA chaparral, on a roof, or even in a completely outside open air building. Uh, as I've been doing my thesis in quarantine because of COVID, my architectural attentions turned toward the radical potential of architecture with air as a material. In the, uh, I'm sorry. Um, in the time of remote learning, my research attentions turned to the interdisciplinary and experimental Black Mountain College, where students worked on the floor, worked on the floor, abandoned their desks, held classes outside, built their own buildings, worked the body into the knowledge here in a class taught by Joseph Albers. They worked the body into the work here. This is Buckminster Fuller acting as a column for his own dome. They demanded black faculty. This is Jacob and Gwendolyn Lawrence who both were hired to teach painting. And here with Merce Cunningham, they worked the knowledge into the body with the invention of modern dance. My architectural attentions turned toward the Black Mountain College Studies building. Oops. 
Here's the plan, as you can see, a kind of uh, double loaded corridor situation familiar to most school architecture. Here in its framing under construction, here just finished construction. Here as a kind of backdrop to the community who grows their own food. And here on the lake, uh, Lake Eden in the uh, Black Mountains. Now I'm going to be phasing back out, but I'll be with you again. This is where we get to the work. The project is called Practice Radical and is six essential practices for rethinking the school. The radical potential of our present moment should not be a missed opportunity. As COVID requires us to spatially re-inhabit our bodies, it allows us to reassess how we teach, how we design, and how we learn from our environment. Practice Radical is a thesis project in six practices that proposes practical and radical forms of knowledge to be deployed in the novel present. To realize a radical state in the body is to operate with volatility, embrace one's interfaces, and to examine the root of an issue. The radical state discussed today is to work with air as a material, practice with multiple identities, and coordinate one's work across many disciplines. Today, we will look at three objects, examine their properties, discuss their origins in a radical state, and how they operate within it. Hello, I'm back. Practice one. Work with air as a material. Here, the first attempt to work with air as a material was the miniatures model that existed as an aromatherapy kit. The essential oils embrace the air and attune our senses to the conditions of our air by diffusing out into the air that we breathe. Here, a color palette could attempt to be some sort of an atmosphere, moving the color and the investigation of color into the air around the object. Here, as a kind of color palette for a clothing line, the clothes and the air assume the same color palette. And last, with the midterm model, a kind of sampling of the air itself as a material. These dots in the back uh, use the Adobe Illustrator uh, gradient sample UI to actually try to find uh, some kind of uh, sampleable color in that material. Exercise two. Sorry, practice two. Operate with volatility. As I said, the essential oil diffuser attempts to work with the volatility of an essential oil, its characteristics to leave its current state and evaporate out into the air and diffuse across multiple surfaces. Here, the kind of addition of this tennis color um, in the kind of draft uh, of that oil scent, or here in a representational scheme where the, uh, the diffusion pattern in the kind of uh, image gradient starts to dematerialize uh, the object itself. Or third, in the midterm model, uh, as the set of interchangeable keys arrayed on a grid embraces a condition in which no primary set uh, arrangement of keys on the board uh, sort of constitute the model. Or here in a color palette for clothing, where uh, uh, sort of dots uh, volatilize off of the ground and become a kind of emissive object. Practice three. Embrace your interfaces. I really love to work with Adobe Illustrator because it not only gives you a sort of what you see is what you get 
live view, but it also has multiple states that show you the data that you're actually working with. Here, the midterm model was an attempt to actually make a model of an interface. Here, showing multiple uh, uh, uses, both as a foreground background, there's a web browser, there's a sort of handheld or hands-free uh, interface, there's a, a smaller browser, there are um, handles and grips and things to touch. And the, the sort of hand plays a main role in that. Um, or in embracing our interfaces, we uh, work with sets of instructions. Here, these are the instructions for the midterm model, which I thought would be perfectly clear and would instruct the photographers to actually make a mess, take it out of the box, pour oil all over the place, which didn't happen. Practice four. Practice with multiple identities. As my work uses color or tries to investigate how we use color, I made a series of over 50 uh, individual color palettes. These color palettes work their way into some collages or image tracings of Nike clothes as a way to try to investigate how it is that we actually work with color and how we can build interfaces around that. As these colors and atmospheres developed, they started to take over the miniature model. Here, a kind of dream uh, color scape induced by a kind of interface. And here, the same kind of tennis, uh, diffuse, volatile overlay, this time falling onto all of the objects in the scene rather than the air around it. Practice five, we're almost done. Examine the root of an issue. Etymology of radical always has a botanic root in which one moves from an extension farther and farther beyond and instead chooses to look down towards the origin of something a sort of inward inflection. So here, as we start to move into the color palettes, the kind of atmospheric overexposure of the object or its potential uh, linguistic references all give us cause to examine the root of why we work with color or why we work with what we do. Here's the kind of... Uh, in between. I forgot what I was going to say about that one. Uh, here's the, the sort of top down um, view of the volatile interface. And again, just to reiterate the sort of uh, delamination between instruction uh, and, and product. Okay, the last one. Coordinate one's self with many disciplines. The real interface potential of working with color allows us to live adjust a color field to inhabit a palette, a set of clothes, or even the architecture of a building. As we can work with multiples, we can always continually update and re-update. Here, the kind of uh, uh, essential oil kit represented in the San Rocco format aligns it back towards the root, the architectural production of a series of objects. And as I leave, I'll leave you with one more picture of the midterm model. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if uh, what I found really poignant in your uh, presentation was the image making capacity. 
of what you're talking about. And I wonder if it needs to be an object again. I, I, I just loved this image about like foreground and background and like uh, sometimes like starting to make them like, I don't know, it was almost like an Ad Reinhardt painting, some of them, like where uh, visually uh, there's like a subtle vibration, let's say. So I don't know, it seems like in the images, I don't know if color is air, but I wonder if like that, that air could be that kind of moment where it, that Ad Reinhardt moment uh, somehow, uh, as opposed to like in the physical model, it doesn't come through as much. It's hard to understand, but I feel like in the technique that you've developed to generate these images, maybe like there's something super poignant there. I, 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 I think your project is really poetic, actually, because um, the, 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 the notion of air and, and to a certain extent, its atmosphere, because I, every color card that you have is, uh, um, suggests a certain atmosphere, right? And um, so there's a, there's a sense of not, so I'm, I'm, but actually less interested in the object as much because I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm much more interested in uh, the idea of uh, presenting your project in a way that is more suggestive, right? Because you cannot, and, 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 and the, how you describe the color, I mean, I'm looking at all the color and I was just completely blown away by how you can just say taupe is this is fawn and 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 uh, this green color is suggests a, a, another mood and and to me that is so beautiful that is so much about a project that you can actually use color and 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 and, and describe an atmosphere that we can actually inha in inhabit i could just imagine myself being in there so i'm i'm i'm, I'm I'm, and, and your presentation is somewhere right now in between and I think I can see why you know what what Margaret say has some truth to that um, you're, you're like right in in the middle of, of those two world um, and it's almost like this is you are the fork road of having to choose to a certain certain extent one or the other so like your the model at midterm is suggesting an interface where you're not actually may not be touching the key, right? Because that there, there, there is an interface uh, that you can use a MIDI to use your hand to wave around and to activate things. That that interface doesn't have to be physical because as you actually can, there's actually an interface that you can do that. Um, so th that to me works really well with how you're presenting your project. Jesse, can I ask you, um, the work right now seems to be hovering between some very um, powerful insights into mm -hmm. things you're learning from things you, we know. Mm -hmm. And then your the kind of uh, perception that you bring to the dimensions of things we know is the insight. And so that allows us to see things differently or to see new possibilities for things. And I'm wondering what's the, what's the proposition in what you're doing? Yeah, I think that's, I think that's a really great question. Um, I kind of, um, I've been looking at like, uh, like K hole, which was like a, a sort of project for, uh, like fashion forecasting. And so the, like one of the kind of like skills that would hopefully be sort of trained through these is like one about prediction that an architect would need 
yep. um, to train one's ability of, of sort of prediction. I mean, nothing that I really said here today was prediction as much as just like you were saying, sort of perception um, presented as um, useful insights. Um, but I think the kind of like the, the point and the kind of the kind of Trojan horse here in this presentation manner is to sort of um, to like talk about the the kind of desperate need for like actually and this this ties into kind of why it's, I'm so lucky to be following how and have um, that kind of conversation already taking place of this one would be the kind of flip of like how do you actually make a building that you can inhabit in which one has to continually sort of manage the air, not through uh, a kind of like, um, you know, environmental systems perspective, but through one where you have to, at the same time as you dematerialize the building in order to get it to be something that is, you know, open to the airflow, as you have to also then justify there being a building at all. So the kind of, um, you know, I mean, so like, yeah, I'm like using a lot of these kind of uh, like Nike references and Apple references and like they're big companies and stuff, but um, you know, it's like, how, how do we actually kind of utilize, like utilize what's going on here? You know, there's never been a better time to like invest in computers, you know, like, uh, like, um, you know, Warren Buffett has like a double digit ownership of Apple, you know, like the writing is on the wall, like we don't need buildings, it's over. So my sort of attempt is to try to flip that and say, actually, how do we start to really attune our senses to the air, which is like the crucial issue. Like we can manage surfaces, but we just like, we can't manage, like we can't do the air. And like, that's not to say that just going outside is gonna like solve all the problems. And that's not to say that like, like going to school is like, one is like, it's not to say that like architecture is the only thing that can solve this problem because it can't. It's one of like many, many, many different disciplines. So that's kind of like, um, I really appreciate that it, that it shows something about sort of perception and insights. Jesse, you did it. I'm I'm so delighted to see the presentation. Everything worked really smoothly, and um, what I guess there's sort of two two thoughts I have. Like one thought is quite simple, but is a really difficult question to answer. Which would be, what is the relationship between air and space? Um, which I think is also equally challenging to try to describe what model of space because um, that's a, a, obviously a huge question for arch architects. Um, but that maybe we'll put a pin in that larger discussion. But what I, what I do like and what I was hoping maybe some of the comments could address is the idea now that a presentation an engagement a sharing of your interests would have this kind of multiplicity to it. And I'm, I, I've already spoken with you about it, but I'm, I, I'm very excited that you are finding some formats to convey this multi-tiered or multi-level thesis, which is on one hand, as Russell was pointing out, a kind of reflection on your own education, which I personally think every thesis is doing that um, maybe some more directly or consciously. And I think that's incredibly important moment in one's career. And then at the same time, starting to lay the foundation for a set of interests and how those will be worked on and kind of developed and through a series of techniques. So that's your kind of second channel. And then you also have this, um, the, the interface as the project and the interface as your presentation method. So this kind of doubling of the interface, which is also a fascinating, um, it's kind of like the air and space question, <laughs> um, right? It's like, well, uh, I don't think we're gonna solve it in the next five minutes, but um, I think that it's, it's definitely a really fascinating uh, kind of double the doubling down. So it's, it's all these layers. And I think a lot of the projects and I'm 
I'm, I'm very um, encouraged that some of the challenges that we face by being remote and distant have actually prompted and, and kind of created this um, multi-layered way of thinking about how we work, how we communicate, what kind of projects we work on, um, who we share that with, how it's shared. I mean, I think it's a really, uh, really poignant and really important thesis in the sense that you're taking all of this on together. And I'm kind of less concerned about which project and which object and is the interface thing working. I just really love that it's that you're going for it all together. So I wanted to say, uh, well, well done with that. And maybe the the guests can comment on some of the more specific ways that you're doing it. But I I, I think that this ability to take it all on is is super ambitious, um, and it. It's a way to get over binary. It's a way to get over linearity. It's a way to get over hierarchy. It's a way to get over uh, all kinds of, um, I think, format questions that normally come about by um, telling a story in a linear way. It's this kind of much more back and forth. And I think you're right. How how is trying to break through some of those um, similar ideas using new forms of interface, which is of course my. Um, little pet project that I've been planting seeds with everyone on. So I'm I just personal note, uh, I'm really excited by seeing all this come together for you guys. Good job. I, I, uh, want, I wanted to point out um, just a couple. So yes, congratulations, Dusty. It's, you know, you're really fortunate to have, um, well, not only the, the, the powerhouse advising team that you have readily available to you, but also these amazing uh, critics for the, for the midterm because this is an extremely subtle layered thesis and it takes I think it takes a it takes a lot to unpack um, I noticed for instance that you were using some pretty loaded words to describe some of your colors um, juxtaposing brick with mulberry row for instance which of course is a nod to Jefferson's Monticello um, and is it, it, it prompts me uh, to engage also with what Devin was talking about. You know, there's a, I think it, it was in the 1920s, there was an Air Force general who said, he who controls the air controls everything. And the idea that somehow property has always been related to the ownership of the ground plane um, is now being challenged in a really profound way by your extension of the spatial imagination of architecture to the realm of the atmosphere, including shifts in light that produce different colors, shifts in smell that produce different sensibilities, and then also what Ming was talking about, even the act of speaking, the act of naming that is so deeply part of your process. So it is a deeply political project and it is about expanding the modes of power that we have available in the world today. And that makes it also disciplinarily important, which is no small thing considering that you are not at all proposing a design. So kudos. Uh, I wanna uh, support all of this. Um, and just to say one thing that I did find in your presentation that obviously you know that I I'm not going to be too happy with is you, your suggestion of that we're done with architecture because I think that that's, that's a cheap shot um, that I'm going to put down right here because I think that everything that you're living off of here has to do with architecture. And if Warren Buffett were the were the cipher of architecture and quality in architecture, I'd be really disturbed. So um, good that he's leaving the scene. Um, but so I think it's not that we're done with architecture, it's what can be done with architecture, right? And I think you're showing us actually what can be done with architecture. You're always talking in spatial terms, you're always talking about the body, that's architecture. So. I, I, I would put an end to that kind of uh, talk. I, I wanted to just like, the reason I wanted to say that was because it was like to justify like, and it's it, because Marika's like, it's great that you didn't like show us a project, right? 
And then I'm like, well, this is all a setup for like a project in which I like, you know, then I'm like, great, now I can spend the next four weeks, you know, drawing a building and being like, look at the air or whatever. Um, so mm -hmm. that is like, yes. Um, but it was to say, you know, like instead of suggesting that like cognitively we like to look at cognitively what happens when you learn on Zoom, you know, it doesn't work because we made the mistake of treating it like we could teach it the same as in person. Once we actually like, you know, keep going and sort of the situation doesn't change, you know, like January 2021, like what's the plan? There's just gonna be a vaccine and it's fine. Like, no, the, the project proposal here is to like, does, is to like provide a sort of design toolkit for like schools to try to actually be like inhabitable in even like the barest way. So no, I, I totally agree with you. I think this is a super authentic, I think this is a really authentic work. And uh, I think it's a really authentic vision about architecture. I just thought that you're, I would, I guess I'm just getting a little tired of this kind of architecture haters who are, you know, continuing to want to live off of architectural uh, means while, you know, undermining it. I, mean, I, I just don't think that, you know, we're already in such hardships. We don't need that. Yeah, I, I, I loved your presentation. I think it's, it's, um, it's very complex, all of the things that you're touching on. And it's enough, there's enough there to really fuel your entire career without even going outside of that, right? Which is amazing and it's an amazing place to be. Um, I, would, I would remember that air, um, air as material is not just something that you smell and um, maybe can see, but also you feel it it actually changes your perception of space in terms of its warmth or its lightness or the breeze. And um, I think that that's something that really all of those, all of those components, I mean, aside from the fact that we need air to literally live, um, all of those components make it really important um, to, to make us remember basically that air is important, right? Like all of these digital interfaces, we get a lot from that. And I think we're having to rely on that a lot more, but the air is always all around us. And as we remember that, I think having to wear masks in public makes us remember what air is doing. It's such an invisible force, but it's all around us. Um, as architecture can really remind us how important air is, um, I think that's something that could that could really remain, you know, from this time. It could really change the way we we see architecture as being something that celebrates air rather than just contains it or mm -hmm. cleans it or whatever. I, I I think I think I think one one of the thing one of the aspect about air that that I, that we tend to forget it's actually very physical. Uh, you know, you thick air, thin air. You get it's you. You actually you actually feel that, and 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 I think that uh, going back to the notion that uh, uh, air and space uh, goes hand in hand together. I think it, that there is a way for you to think about your project when it comes to working with interface and working with architecture in a building because uh, the, uh, the contain, the containment of air and the interface of how that can change through interface would change the space and would change how the air would go through the building. So I don't think that it's unreasonable to think that one cannot develop an architecture project from this. I do think that you could uh, because I, 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 I 
think that it's very spatial. I mean, you can feel it. It's you know, the sense of being claustrophobic and lack of air. I mean, you, you, you know, when you start using the term air in all of these different ways, you suddenly realize how physical air could be. This was a, a really fantastic discussion. Thank you, everyone. I'm um, going to offer you an air break <laughs> of a couple of minutes um, to maybe sit, step outside, take a breath. And then um, if it's okay with everyone to stay with us, I know we're over time. I don't know, I'm always over time in my group. So um, if you're, if you're uh, available to stay, we would love it. There's two more projects. I think it'll be worth the wait. So um, can, can we all come back together like in five minutes and then wrap up with uh, Lindsay, Ju Chang and Wang Shu. Would that be okay with everyone? Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. we, thank you so much. Okay, we'll see you in like five minutes.
Hi, everyone. Okay, Lindsay Ju Chang. Hi. Hi. So thanks everyone for hanging in there with us. We really appreciate it, and a special thanks to our guests who have gone much longer than we expected. So um, we we appreciate your time today, and we're going to go uh, into the last two. So uh, Lindsay and Ju Chang, they're going to uh, take the screen, and then we'll wrap up afterward with Wang Shu. Hi, um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I am Lindsay. And I'm Zhu Chen. <laughs> and the title of our thesis is Ordinal Complex. And um, so this project is mainly about two things, digitality and materiality. So before, uh, before we start, we would like to um, talk a bit about um, our thoughts and observations about that. First, there is such a tendency to have a shape prior to materials in the digital world, and no one would even find it strange at all. So if you open any mainstream 3D software, there will be tons of functions um, dedicated to making any shapes. Materials are just considered secondary as images applied on the surface. And on the other hand, while um, archite architects acknowledge materials in different ways, most of them would agree that physical materials are considered existing resources. So unlike shapes, you don't really invent them. You choose from a pool of um, existing materials when you already have the shape. So we have this um, expectation that digital design hardly has any contribution to the invention of materials. And the goal of our thesis is to flip expectations on both ends. So our thesis begins in computational space, and we rethink how a design typically would come about in a specific terms, how we understand materials in digital. The way that we reconsider this is that we presume we need some digital material before we need a shape, or at least we need them at the same time. Rather than thinking we first put a shape down and then we cover it with a texture map, this thesis has produced a series of novel computational materials. That's what we call the digital foundry, where digital materials are created without purpose. It is a material asset to be used. The videos explain their virtual fabrication process and their material behavior, like how they could potentially affect the shape. Some of the materials are relatively closer to what we understand as material in the real life, while others try to play with the digitality inherent in the workflow. For instance, this material, we took a traffic cone and some basic geometries. The pattern on the object is then reinterpreted as data as vertex color information and redistribute it in a new material through simulation. Those materials transform their state. As you can see here, by manipulating the dials, turning them, we can create a series of different material properties and effects and know that they are three dimensional. The intention is that they have thickness and then we've broken them down into what we call the super chunks and the micro chunks. And that those are available to us singly, individually, or in a collective interface that we will explain in a bit. And then we take the second step. 
So we inverted this conventional process. We now have the available materials and then we apply shape. And we do that in several ways through molds, through Boolean operations and so forth. And this inversion, as well as the kind of transforming state of materials has now opened up for us a whole another way of thinking about a computation kind of digital foundry. And another way of thinking about compositions that doesn't start first with shape. And at first we named these materials based on our intuition. But then in order to really separate them from the conventional materials, we put them into this um, anagram generator and pick some names that are totally random and irrelevant to um, the material's appearance. And in this specific project, we took the Arnoldi triplex by Frank Gehry as a starting point for the shape assets. And that's how we got the um, title of our thesis project. <laughs> and then this shape asset are inserted into this 3D space, which we call the interface. The intention is to use this three-dimensional interface as a guide to investigate how materials and shared assets can come together. Assets inserted into the interface will be sorted into parts. Then the parts move in a way that is controlled by the interface, like um, scaling, rotating, transforming, and so forth. Their movement is based on certain rules, meaning they can go on as long as we want, with no repetitive combination. Here we cut out 1,200 frames for the use of this project. As you can see in the video, materials interact with the parts and generate new form. This interface helps us to receive the assets in a new way and study the new possible composition when materials and shape come together. Moments and chunk capture in this process will be um, further developed into the project. And then the first test of our um, of the new chunks that designed with um, such a workflow were then 3D printed as our miniature models. Um, as you can see in these photos here, they still don't have a sense of scale and are waiting to be reinterpreted. And instead of printing models first and then doing surface treatment afterwards, such as um, sanding and spray painting, um, as we would normally do, um, these mi miniature models are printed with a multicolor filament, as you can see in the video. And um, therefore, the patterns, textures, and colors are created um, during the production process, along with the shape together. And then um, in the next stage, we developed four houses uh, with this workflow that we developed um, earlier. And with these houses as examples, we would like to propose the five points um, towards digital architecture. So play the video. So number one, um, the flat flatness. So space and object is no longer modeled volumetrically, but designed by its materiality and shape at the same time. Shape and material are considered equal in such um, design process. And number two, the- uh, Wait, what? <laughs> material image does not equal to material behavior. So material now can do unexpected th things. Number three, the openings. There are no separate components called windows or doors, only openings embedded in the materials. Number four, the thicker, the better. Space carved out from materials with layers creates a non-consistent thickness of facade and spatial quality, meaning what is ex exposed is not certain. Number five, the tactility. The, co the coexistence of digitality and tactility is possible. Some of these points will be better demonstrated in the following images and videos. And here we just want to um, show you some photos of our um, meter models. It's one of the four houses. And here is a digital version. Should be allowing to see the interiors as well.
And now we would like to show you um, some details. So we'll, we'll um, flip through some interior renders of the four, ho four houses one by one. And um, eventually these images will be compiled into one final video. So here comes house number one. Number two. So basically here, um, these houses are still being placed on this desert. Um, but um, after we printed out the poster, which is right behind us, super big, um, we then decided to place these houses into a different landscape. Um, it's going to be here in a minute. And that's our, um, oh, right here. And that's our, um, going to be um, our final format. Um, so they, they will be placed into this fabricated um, digital environment instead of this landscape. And he, the, these two images are the first draft of the design scene. And the goal is to create a background that better demonstrates our um, overall concept, which is a rethinking of the boundary between um, digital and digital. And I just missed two tiny videos here to show a little bit of motion in our house. And that's basically what we're, uh, where we're at, at this point. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> gonna... um, I think that's a great job. I think it's quite amazing. The one thing I would say uh, is I guess I don't know why you need the Arnoldi complex in the end. And the one that looks, that feels too close to that, it feels like it's, mis it's constraining your materiality idea. Like, I think your materiality comes first idea is more free if, it, if you don't start with the Arnoldi complex so much. I don't even, I'm not even sure I would mention it. Do you know, like to me, when I see your final three houses, Two of them, the orange one and the blue one, seem to be pushing the boundaries of what you're really trying to do. And the, and the pink and green one too, in a certain way. Uh, but the one like in the lower right-hand side, um, it doesn't feel like it's pushing the boundary enough. And it, as far as the, the question of materiality and what kind of difference that could bring to the project, it's not that it's not an interestingly designed object, but I feel like in the other three, the way that materiality is like transforming the object and it feels like apparently like it came first more uh, than in that fourth one. Something about that fourth one, it doesn't seem to play the same game. And, but I think it's fascinating what you're doing. And I love the idea of a constructed uh, environment, uh, something very man-made. Um, I understand that that's your first pass, but I actually think there's a lot of um, territory in that man-made environment that, that where you could push that materiality idea even more. I think that's a great point, Margaret, super. Um, that we, in the last pinup, we all, we had the same <laughs> point about that house number, the, the plain our house. But I would mm. say that the only thing in defense of the Arnaldi trip, I think you made the right point, but uh, in I think it's more to do with the idea of chunking than the material aspect, that the Gary mm. project and putting it through Devin's idea of this 3D game board and then uh, using it to re-chunk it 
as just a practice of, uh, let's say, achieving new substance uh, without it referring to the Arnaldi in particular, that I think maybe could be maybe could be explained differently or or put that spin on it that it's about chunking rather than material. But oh, but I think your point is really good. What if it also was a was a um, uh, a, a triptych instead of a you know what I mean? What if you just have three? Uh, and the Arnoldi complex, another quality of it is that it's a triptych, these three objects next to each other that are kind of each slightly different. So there's something about the three that's interesting. But I understand what you're saying about the chunking. I'm not, I, I think that the Arnoldi complex and the way you used it led you to some new considerations, but I don't know that every, I don't know that you need to, I don't know that that's your narrative or that's your story. Right, 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 totally. Well, I feel like the reference. Well, but I, I think there's something about. I mean, I, I really, I really like this project actually, and 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 I think the the, the riff of uh, the the three little pigs, as Frank would, Gary would call them, uh, is 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 actually the uh, the point to the project, right? So so you know, I like. Peter is talking about chunking, but at the same time, I think there's there's a lot of materiality that also goes along with this project, and I'm not quite sure that one uh, uh, would eliminate the other one because your project also has to do with materiality, and and if if anything, I'm 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 just curious in terms of how because I think that to a certain extent it it did get lost the materiality aspect of the of, of the project when 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 you see the project at you know, as you're developing the, 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 you know, the, the three houses at the end. And, and um, it, to a certain extent, I think that the strength of the project would really be uh, to, to reinforce the, you know, the, the, th the three little pigs or mouse or whatever you would want it to, may want it to rename your project later. Uh, I, I think that's, uh, because it, there's a genealogy from 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 what from that reference that you took, and I, I I like the fact that you took that as a reference. I was going to say I think there's a kind of it's a sly reference, and I wouldn't over explain it. I think everybody kind of gets it. Uh, an architect who obviously was you know looking at uh, particular artists and talking about how, how do I achieve that kind of spontaneity with what Frank would call cheap materials. So there's a preoccupation with, with materiality, but it's obviously not the only driver in that piece of work. I think it's probably important that you start with something that's given so that you can chunk it and move on to the subject, which is not the, the kind of formal qualities of the building, at least at the get-go uh, to prefigure, as you said. I, I was gonna ask you that, I, I think it's a really interesting discussion because I was, you know, uh, re thinking about someone like Eisenman who would absolutely want to move away from the whole issue of materiality because he sees it as a kind of ph phenomenological distraction from what he thinks is the kind of, you know, essence of an architectural pursuit. And so you imagine when he has to build the building that it, the, the question isn't what's the materiality of the building, the question is what can I use to sort of take us away from that discussion as quickly as possible. Um, and I, I think you're reintroducing this into a set of new terms and, and literally a, a different environment to sort of re-examine the role of it. That's a super interesting and, and compelling question to take on. Uh, and I, so I think it's a very contemporary thesis in that regard. I'm very interested to hear more about, um, maybe not all right now, but in, in the end for the thesis about when you uh, made the point that materiality no longer had uh, behavioral properties, if I think I understood you correctly, but, uh, or maybe physical properties, but it had behavioral properties, or even in this case, I'd say representational properties. Um, you know, and so I'm wondering what the lexicon of that to parallel materiality as we've thought about it so romantically in the physical world that the physical properties of materiality are, you know, mass, um, texture, color, um, even extending into uh, the ways one would work it to form a building and that it has properties of being worked one way versus another, assembled one way versus another. 
right now I was looking at the things you made and they seem to be dwelling in a few properties which are primarily about color, reflectivity, some notions of texture. Um, and then it, it seems like those are maybe the most important ones at this moment. Um, I, I think it would be interesting if maybe you were able to sort of use the repertoire uh, to, to start to talk about how the properties of, of this materiality differ from it as we have known it. Um, uh, right now, I, for example, I think in this world that you're presenting this materiality, there probably isn't any correlation with fabrication, for example, right? Because it's a digital fabrication at this moment. And I don't know if, if how far you can extend the argument, but I, I think it's a really interesting to extend it um, both as a compelling artifact, but also as a kind of uh, maybe more, uh, I, I, I hesitate to use the word theoretical, but a more speculative idea about what this new materiality is. And I, I, again, I think it's, it's a, something that really is well worth examining. Yeah, I wanna, I wanna just add to that about the behavior of the material. I think when you guys said that um, one of the, one of the pieces that you're interested in is how the material image um, differs from the material um, performance, or I think you said behavior. And I think since you're using video as a way of representing, I think right now the material doesn't necessarily, uh, the visual appearance of it doesn't seem to me to be very different. Um, but it could be very easily, I think. And the way that you represent that is through, um, in a digital world, maybe through time-based media, right? So you're using video now. How can we interject some of the properties um, that might be unexpected onto the materials that you're visually representing now? And I would even I would even bring that back out if you're um, in, if you're interested in it into how that would actually change the physicality when it is a physical object how it might how you might rethink the fabrication of that or um, the material properties of that when it becomes physical if it becomes physical if that's important to you um, I think there was a moment in one of your videos where you showed kind of an expansion happening. It's like a kind of a hard object that kind of then had a bubble coming out of it, maybe one of the last images. Um, and I think that that was an interesting moment to me where something unexpected is happening and you're kind of like, what is, what is that? That bulge, yeah. Where it actually kind of transforms what that material might otherwise appear. Um, I, would, I would actually suggest or I'm, what I'm interested in your project is really an amplification of moments like that. Um, one thing, one place where I found it a little bit, I don't know, I, it kind of brought me out of your narrative as you're presenting was when we were looking at the renderings of the, of the house, the houses, and um, the, the kind of properties like a cactus, a digital cactus, or um, the handrail um, kind of brought me out of this idea that this is a, a digital world and, and took me into like, well, who is this house for? Um, who is this space for? Is it necessary to have things like objects where we want in our current world? Or is this an opportunity to kind of uh, change that a little bit, for instance? Um, with a material application. So, so instead of having uh, a handrail that is an object that is added to the project or to the forms that you're creating, maybe the material expands in some way when it needs to, to produce that. Um, but I think in, in, in exploring that, you really have to ask who is a digital architecture for? Um, and I would be interested, I'm really interested in, in knowing what your, um, what your answer to that might be or might look like as you explore these forms. 
I think that the, that's a really great question, set of questions actually for you guys. I would back up though on this image versus behavior. And I think you need to quote Devin Weiser on that because that is, uh, and there's a few instances of that that I think um, what? deserve Where? Uh, image versus behavior, that that's actually your position uh, or an idea that you've developed that is not necessarily manifested in this project yet, or is, you know, so I think you have to be a little more careful with taking those things quite so directly and literally um, without a transformation, because I don't, I think they're making, I think their, their, their points are really important because I just, give a little bit of context. I think Devin's point of that about that has to do with composites, not with digital material, purely digital material, but has to do with composite materials that are in a way computational materials, which is a little different, I think from what Kristen is, I think very well uh, pointing out that these are digital materials, not uh, uh, computational materials. And there's a difference there. But what I what I love about this conversation, and these are all such great points, is that it you you your thesis has essentially trapped us, which is fantastic. It's like you it's like a honey trap in which a digital honey trap, of course, in which you know it's like if we believe that the project will be that a piece of architecture will be built out of existing materials and systems, you're like no no because we're doing it in the computer. And then if we say we're starting in the computer, then of course the question uh, that Russell raised, which we knew was gonna be a question since day one of this thesis, well, how will you actually manifest this in physical materials? Will you you know, grow cottage cheese or like how will this actually happen? And so um, you, you in a way um, by, by trapping yourselves in this um, uh, chicken and egg type of problem, I, I think it's really a, a just so great that like to see the struggle and to hear the different comments. And we were talking last week with Marika about the shape and matter discussion and how these are like so fundamental to architecture. Um, and to, even to Margaret's point about the Arnaldi tripec, triplex, like in a way, I, I think she's right. Like you've kind of, You've, you've kind of given up your thesis by showing us that, that that was the start point and that it probably is worth thinking about either hiding that a little bit or being more clearer because otherwise it feels more like you substituted the digital geometry for um, a kind of you know fidgetal geometry. But what I would say that I'm now that I see the whole presentation, which I agree was an incredible, beautiful presentation. And I love that you started all the way back with thesis prep and you just sort of, you just like built it and built it and built the discussion for us. And it was completely clear. I think that this final loop that you're about to go into, which is the, the site being the digital foundry that you are going to design as well. I think this, will really start to make the whole thesis come together because you will be in the interface, you will be in the kind of geometrical properties um, and that you will ultimately be in the, that sort of animated world that uh, Kristen was mentioning, even like a little sign of construction there. And what I'm, what it, <laughs> I'm tempted to tell you because I know you're going to go, I know you'll go and do it, but like maybe not. Um, if you imagine this was your starting point, if like where you are now with this, um, this incredible kind of Ledoux type of image of, of orange paint Ledooing out of the, 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 the ruin. <laughs> um, if you salt imagine, works. yeah, yeah, salt works. So like if you imagine this was now your, start and like you were creating um, in this digital environment. This is a sort of outdoor construction site, but it's actually in the computer. Like I do wonder what the architectural pieces would look like if you now had this truly digital foundry, if you didn't start with the design of the buildings or the houses, but you said, okay, now I have this, you know, set of ingredients. I have all these materials at my disposal and how, how would they go together? 
It's a, it's, mm-hmm. I, 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 I think it's so provocative. It's just really fantastic. And um, the, the three little pigs, we've got the brick here and we're just missing a little bit of straw. You know, I'll throw in the, fi- the fiber components for you there. So you've got uh, almost, almost all the weird digital versions of, of um, what, what we could expect from the three little pigs. It's, it's three little digital pigs. I wanted to I wanted to pick up uh, a little bit on on uh, on what Christian said earlier about the handrail, and and to me um, it's it seems like they, there's a point where there are difference between the three houses, and the houses that uh, actually have like the, the 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 blue liner on the inside feel so much more like a traditional construction and less digital because it's 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 uh, you know it's like a tiling of the interior so i i i would say that that uh, as you move forward for the next month i think you may want it to really be uh, uh, really kind of insist on how this is like digitally constructed and 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 kind of shed the kind of the traditional way of constructing with uh, putting you know either like handrail which which may not belong there or tiling of the wall which may not belong there and, and kind of like furnishing of the space because I think that would kind of strengthen your project much more I think from my point of view to kind of get rid of some of the noise which are not necessarily helping your project okay fantastic that's um, great though yeah I, really. yeah I agree I think this is an amazing project I think mm-hmm. it's really beautiful and really contemporary mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, um, Kristen, I know you mentioned that we've already we've gone so far over over time here. We have one more, but please, um, if you can stay awesome, and if you need to just excuse yourself, no no problem. Um, we we really thank you very much for your time today and for joining us. It was great to meet you, and uh, we appreciate all the comments. So, um, we'll give you a little. Thank you in advance in case thank, you need to. Thank you. I might I might fall off, but I'm going no to No problem. No problem. Thank you so much. Okay, we're going to turn this over to our final presenter, Wang Shu. Uh, take it away, Wang. Thanks. Uh, hi, my name is Wang Shu, and my title was called uh, Diary of a Lost Theater. Uh, diaries involve memories. Yeah, they're are a narrative, narrative, so they also document change, uh, which is memory. Uh, in this season, I propose to remake the defunct Million Dollar Theater in downtown Los Angeles, um, South Broadway, by adding two new state of art cinemas that are floating about, defying gravity, like uh, thought clouds of abstractions, simultaneously real and imaginary. This combined with a new excavation of the a uh, magnificent yet unoccupied and defunct theater creates an unexpected new space in the city to animate uh, its future. Uh, this proposal uh, literally cuts into the existing theater on earth and ruin to be taken over by a wild garden becoming a new public space. The building is a new combination of the past and the future. Time evolves at a different rate. Uh, this corner, which is across from the Broadway building, is not only famous in the history of the city, but it is also famous in the cinematic expression of the city appearing in such iconic movies like Blade Runner. Uh, we can all picture this, uh, yet each of our pictures is different. This theater is currently literally an unoccupied void in the city. It is a definition of defunct void in the city. Uh, my project seeks to remake this iconic yet defunct theater with a new urban intersection, including systems of involving nature of the city, involving time, and by rebuilding a new iconic city uh, in a manner that is unpredictable, variable, and as a vitality to the city. So my proposal uh, is reanimated through its unexpected excavation 
of the floating cinema uh, creates a new wildness that uh, reconnect to the public sequence of space in the city through the interior and unused block, creating a public sequence of space in conversation with the uh, Broadbury building and the proposal a continued future in the cinematic expression. And here is a, a, a facade pattern, and this is my main theater. And uh, here is my theater during the nighttime, nighttime and during the daytime. Yeah, uh, thanks for listening. That's it. Thanks, Wang Shu. Do you want to maybe just um, let it, uh, that's a great screensaver you have. Do you want to <laughs> just mm -hmm. um, kind of scroll back through a couple of the images for us just so we can, or maybe you could array them on the screen. Um, okay. Thanks. Um, Wang Shu, um, uh, mm -hmm. can you, oh yes, can you uh, go back to this section? Uh, so the theater that you show is the one which would be the, on top. Uh, yeah. Right, okay. And the, and the existing million uh, Dollar theater is below in the at the ground level, which is a green. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Oh, I, yeah, I see that. Can you share a few more images? Can you tease us a little bit more? Okay, uh, here is yeah. a million dollar theater and yeah. I'm going to make it into the uh, public garden. I, I think I think maybe, maybe um, it's it's a little bit unclear to me um, uh, if your thesis is uh, that the theater the the theater itself is a thesis which is not like like the physical main theater but the uh, the entire experience of right of the of going up to the theater. Uh, starting from the uh, starting from the uh, ground level with the existing million million dollar theater and then circulation up to the main theater, so that is a whole project and not just what we're seeing right now, uh, which is just a development of a theater on top of it. Um, so th that's why I wanted you know because I, I'm kind of really interested in in uh, in in hearing you talk a little bit more about this project in terms of like, you know, this drawing, this section and the overall image, which I think is more than just uh, one thing. Yeah, the project is, uh, I don't know why, but conjuring some images for me of the abandoned theaters in Detroit uh, where, you know, they, they've been abandoned and then uh, they're overcome by rubble, dust and nature. Um, and there seems like there's something about the thesis that it, the, the image you showed of the garden, I don't know if you can go back to that, please. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if, I'm really trying to suss a thesis out of this, uh, as opposed to maybe a project, which is an interesting project about working within an existing building. 
but the so the thing that was coming into mind was the the image of the interior with the garden inside mm -hmm. um was this idea of rewilding the building if i can use that phrase um and i'm wondering if you said well it's about rewilding as it's introducing landscape into a kind of unexpected situation and then maybe to just add on to what Ming was saying is that, you know, how does that manifest itself beyond the construct of the theater, which is, seems resolved and clear and has a kind of strong urban presence, all of those things. Um, but how would you imagine that the insertion of this piece rewilds this building that is, you know, quasi abandoned uh, in, in the downtown? So, I'm just wondering if you could maybe think about a term like that that would take on other characteristics and they don't necessarily have to be about um, plants and, and foliage, but this idea of maybe what it does to the existing building right now, it seems a little bit like an insertion that uh, could be a little bit uh, indifferent to what's going on with it, as opposed to it kind of radically reframing what's going on in the existing building, which is what this image does for me anyway. I'm just trying to find a way into uh, providing a little more in the thesis uh, about the situ might come from the situation, but also to think about what the quality of this is by going to all this work. Right, Russell. I was I was thinking a little bit. Um, um, thanks, Kristen. Thank you. Um, I was thinking a little bit too about. I just put the um, the note in the chat about Stan Douglas's Detroit series that um, his his photographs. Um, I think you'll you'll enjoy seeing those, Wang Shu. But um, it's a kind of uh, I guess a choice in a way between whether or not it's it the effects that you want are something that's abandoned, but um, I like the rewilding um, thought that Russell put out there. So it's a kind of, it's a sense of abandonment, but something else is taking over versus you're actually gonna go and design all these spaces in a new way. And that's, it's, it's a really interesting paradox because the, ex the exterior render that you have is, is super compelling in the kind of the evening scene. I mean, it's very atmospheric and suggests that there's a lot of quality, but then when you go inside, it's like, oh no, it was abandoned. So you kind of have these two worlds happening at the same time. Um, what might be called um, X over, the, like the letter X over where two fictions exist at the same time, which I think is, is, a, is a kind of cool thing that um, maybe you could play up a little bit and make that part of um, the thesis conversation so that from outside it appears like one world and then inside there's something else. I mean, of course this is your call, but um, I think you juxtapose uh, these sort of two visual effects for us. So it mm -hmm. might be interesting to think about how you can play into that. Okay. And, and I, I actually, I, you know, there, there is also, I mean, all of the theater on Broadway, uh, I mean, you know, there's a whole sense of um, decay, but uh, at the same time, repurposing the, the theater, even in, in its state of decay. I mean, I, that, I've been going there for strange events. Uh, in, in those theater when they were still abandoned, but somehow they get leased out for one evening uh, for uh, you know, some other programs. And, uh, but, but there's something that I find very interesting about uh, your project, which is like this completely glossy, brilliant image on the exterior. And, and, and I'm just wondering because of the verticality of the project and, and, and I keep on going back to that section um, because it's not just like one thing, it's, it's a multiple thing, it's much more complex. And, and if, if, if maybe you create some kind of narrative between that image that you create at the at the bottom with the existing theater that may turn into uh, this lush garden. But as you go up to something very new, there is a narrative that, that 
that has this, this world that transform and change itself. Because right now it's almost as if I'm looking at this and I see like two different things, you know, there's the existing theater, the glossy image on the outside and the theater, and there's nothing really that kind of tie the thesis together at this point. I think I'm, 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 I, I, I think Russell very rightly talks about the, uh, the, the theater being in its decay stage because it's just something really kind of compelling about that imagery and, and that maybe you can use that and, and make some connection between the two. Mm -hmm. Have you made any physical models of the of the whole thing? Not the like like you showed some kind of more fragments, but have you tried? I know it's incredibly challenging to make physical models right now, but I was just curious if it was something that you tried where you had the the kind of the shell, the bubble part, and then the other pieces inside. Uh, not yet. <laughs> Because I think it might give you um, just another way of looking, right? Because even though theaters, it's always really nice to see them in cross section, what seems potentially really exciting about what you have is you have sort of multiple theaters that aren't cut all the same way. So it, it could be the kind of thing that you could play with these volumes in the volumes. Okay. But a, mo a model would be, I know you have a 3D printer I, or two. So <laughs> maybe even just some baby baby models could be cool. I don't know. <laughs> Are there any other comments or thoughts for Wang Shu, Margaret? You're muted. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I would just say that to me, the excavation part of what you're proposing is obviously not showing up so well right now. But I think what your proposal is, is that the way you're gonna, one of the ways you're gonna kind of uh, like allow entropy to occur in this existing theater is through cutting some holes in it, some very specific holes in it, both through the roof and through the side that's gonna literally reconnect it to the city, which is how it's gonna make sense for this kind of wilderness to take over. Uh, so I think like just from a design standpoint, uh, there's more kind of like specific work that you need to do uh, to really drive it home. But I actually think the idea of like the kind of removal of this existing building as a way to remake it is a strong one. And then I think the part that you add you don't need so many internal pieces. I think on the inside, it's much fewer pieces with a cinema uh, theater. Um, there's not as much back of house stuff with the cinema. So I think the kind of thickness, the, the shell to me in your project isn't just a thin shell, it's like a thickness of matter. It's shaped one way on the outside and one way on the inside. So I think that inside profile you need to be more specific about and the cutting profile you need to be more specific about. Great, well, I, I wanna just compliment and uh, congratulate all the students today. This was a really fantastic midterm, great discussion, uh, great seeing all the work and I, I hope you enjoyed it and found it productive um, and, and exciting and motivating for your one month to go um, marathon. Uh, it's, it's, I think, t totally uh, exciting to see ev everything come together. I, I mean, I'm, I'm really, really happy. And um, I want to thank the students and, and thank our guests. Uh, thanks, Russell. Thanks, Ming. Um, we appreciate you hanging out way past the scheduled time. Um, really, really appreciate it. And um, I, I want to just say again, uh, it's been it's been a wonderful day and wonderful conversation. So thank you. I see all the thank yous in the chat. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, uh, we we look forward to giving you Friday off. 
We will, I know at least uh, Peter and I, we have uh, individual meetings set up with you guys for Monday, kind of like post, uh, we'll, we'll do a kind of like post game analysis for the, the midterm, but I think like get some rest, take care of yourself, um, Ju Chang, go out to eat maybe and wear a mask and get some spicy food and get ready. Um, and then we'll all head back uh, together on Monday and, and just go for it. I, there's so many good things. I can't wait to see this all come together. So um, thanks thanks to all the students. Thank you. Thank very you much. very much, Russell, Ming, and, uh, and Margaret. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent. Okay. Nice to see everyone. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Good to see good you luck. too, Margaret. Yeah. Bye bye. Take care, everyone. Bye, okay. guys. Bye. Take care.